Okay, let's go to number seven. Item number seven is an update by Chief Allen and the District Attorney regarding site and release resolution on Class A and B possession of marijuana offenses from November 12, 2019. If, if you're not on, please mute, mute your uh, mic. We're on. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Assistant Chief Victor Saru, Police Department. Chief Allen. We're gonna I'm going gonna, to let Victor present this, and then uh, we'll go to questions or uh, Mr. Esparza, and I believe also uh, Judge Morales might be available for comment. Can we get the presentation up, please? It's going to be under the site and release resolution item. I'm curious. Did we did we invite did we invite Representative Joe Moody to speak as well? Did anybody reach out to him from the police department? We invited right. the parties who actually right. have a stake in whether they're the court or the DA's office or the police office. We did not invite um, anyone who wasn't within the realms. We did speak to Joe Moody. You'll see it in the presentation, sir. So he's a stakeholder or you're considering not a stakeholder? Not a stakeholder. Okay, uh, Assistant Chief Sarud again. So we're going to talk about the site and release program. Goal two, set the standard for a safe and secure city. Uh, we're going to talk about what we know in the resolution recommendation and then the discussion as noted uh, we've got district attorney mr jaime sparse online and also judge morales if we could go to the third slide please the third slide talks about um the resolution and a small synopsis on it it's in regards to the direction to meet with the stakeholders and make recommendations to its implementation uh, implementation next slide please so when we look at the site and release, it's under the Code of Criminal Procedure Article number 1406. I won't read it verbatim, uh, but it talks about the fact that Class A or Class B misdemeanors, instead of taking a person uh, before a magistrate, a citation can be issued. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the resolution and the meetings and such, um, individuals that we had the meetings with, uh, we've got Mr. Jaime Esparza, we also know that Sheriff Wiles and the police department, we favor the first chance program, and we're gonna to touch on the first chance program briefly. We also met with Mr. State Representative Joe Moody and Ms. Judge Ruben Morales, who's also online out of County Court 7, um, and they also, they support the site and release program. Going to the next slide, please, on site and release. When we look at the legal review on this, um, short uh, bullet presentation here, the program's allowed under the Code of Criminal Procedure and it also is entirely discretionary. We know that it's left to the departments to participate. So next slide, please. On the next slide, we're gonna talk about the First Chance Program and the reason for this is that in the meetings we've had in regards to the site and release, the process hasn't been introduced in regards to it. So we talk about what we know but we also know that it mirrors the first chance program and the first chance program has been in ex existence with an MOU and the district attorney's office initially passed back in uh, November, December of 2017. This is a program, a partnership uh, with a memo memorandum of understanding signed by the city manager and the DA's office and the program was implemented on December 12, 2017. And this is a program that's a diversion program. Um, by the uh, district attorney's office to the first time offenders who would otherwise be charged with possession of marijuana. And the reason we wanna introduce the conversation again with the first chance program, it's because it's a program that allows the release of an eligible offender out at the scene. This program has been in existence for two years, like I mentioned before, and it's also a voluntary program for the individual. So one of the reasons we wanted uh, Mr. Jaime Esparza to join in on the discussion and we could also have uh, Judge Morales chime in on his thoughts as well. Um, this program was implemented to address first time offenders and give them the opportunity to have a clean record. Mr. Esparza, are you, are you online now? If you can chime in on, on the program through the DA's office. You're on mute though. Uh, 
I apologize. Uh, we are, uh, we do, we do have the first chance program. And really what the first chance program does is it's the officer's discretion, but the officer is permitted to allow the, the possession of marijuana case for the defendant to be released. That would be the suspect to be released. He hands him a, a no, a, a, a document which tells the offender when he needs to report so that he can start the first chance program. If he, if he completes the program, which is an um, administrative fee of $100 and uh, community service of eight hours, although during the, this COVID time, we've suspended the eight hours of community service, then we won't file the charge. And the only thing he'll have on his record is that the police department identified him. So I guess there is a case number. Uh, the police department can probably tell you better than that, but there's no filed case, no arrest and no filed case. I don't know if you want me to go, how much further you want me to go into it. I can tell you how many cases we've handled. Uh, since that, we do it with, in conjunction with the sheriff's department and the police department, and we're bringing on other agencies. And in, um, in, 20, in, in December of 2019 to the end of December of 2019, we handled... Uh, 484 cases, and we have about 75% completion rate. We've had real good luck with it, and we're really pleased with it. We like we we definitely prefer it to cite and release. And I can talk to you about those disadvantages if you want, and maybe you want to hear from Judge Morales. Mayor, um, I have a point of clarification, Mayor. Okay, Rosa Hernandez, I, I'm sorry, I was waiting. I've got uh, you and I got hit Rivera first, you and then Representative Manello listed. No, I just have a point of clarification um, for Ms. Neiman. Um, the, I, I thought we were going to be talking about the site and release. That's how the agenda item was posted. Why are we talking about the first chance program? This is, it is cited as a site and release program. I, I'm not, uh, I don't know why the first chance program is being mentioned. Uh, Assistant Chief Sarur again, uh, going back, I believe it's on the third or fourth slide in regards to the site and release program. One of the things that I had touched on, we had meetings. As far as the site and release program, no process has been introduced to us in regards to that. But I think we'd be derelict not to mention the fact that the first chance program mirrors what's proposed or at least what we know in regards to the first chance program and it's a program that's supported by the police department sheriff's department and district attorney's office so if we're looking to implement a process we have a process that's already in place so uh, this is ahead. judge Ruben Morales. i don't know if it's appropriate for me to speak at this point but if i can yes sir Okay, so uh, I'm Judge Ruben Morales. I'm the judge of county court at law number seven, but I'm also the lo local presiding judge for the county courts. Uh, the county courts are the courts that are responsible for handling the kind of cases that are generally going to be eligible for site and release. I think a more accurate uh, term for the program is site and summons. Uh, site and summons and the only reason I say that is because what, what you're doing essentially, or what the police department or law enforcement is doing when they use the program, is they're giving someone a citation and then they're giving them a summons to show up for court. Um, there's been mention the various, with the various people that I've talked about that there is not currently a process set up to deal with those cases. I can tell everybody that the only thing we need to set up a process is the go ahead from law enforcement at this point with law enforcement, uh, or up to this point, law enforcement uh, was not using that process. So it does not make sense to set up a process for something that's not going to be used. But I can tell you that we do have the ability to set up that process. Uh, just an easy example is, you know, before this whole, uh, before we started, we, we got into this whole situation with the, the COVID virus, we weren't set up to do uh, inmate pleas from the jail by video conferencing. We didn't have anything in place to do that. But once it became apparent that we needed to do that, uh, we got that process up and running within a week. 
And I can tell you that getting the site and release process up and running uh, will be a whole lot easier than getting the video conference process that we got up and running to deal with uh, inmate cases. Uh, so we can do that. And I'm, I guess another thing that I want city council to be aware of is that the courts are uh, ready, willing, and able to you know, set something up so that this process can be instituted. And we would like to set it up in conjunction with uh, law enforcement. We absolutely want and need their input because they're the ones driving uh, this whole situation and the district attorney's office. Uh, you have to understand that site and release is a completely discretionary program. I mean, the, the police department, law enforcement, and the DA's office continue to, uh, they will continue to have full discretion as to how they prosecute cases. Um, they keep bringing in first chance program into the conversation. First chance program is a great program. I'm glad they use it. I'm glad they do it. It gives a lot of people opportunities to avoid having records, uh, criminal records that might uh, that would hinder them, hinder hinder them in their future. I know there was a lot of talk earlier about workforce and things like that. Jobs are very important, and, and when people end up with these kinds of arrests on their record and sometimes ultimately convictions, uh, it hinders their ability to get jobs and you know go to college, a lot of different things. So I applaud the First Chance program. It's a great program. I applaud uh, uh, District Attorney Jaime Esparza for instituting that program, and I applaud the police department for instituting that program. But the first chance program and site and release are completely different, not completely, they're not the same thing. So the first chance program is a situation where the police department or law enforcement officers make a decision that a person will not be arrested. Essentially, they're making a decision not to prosecute. Site and summons uh, is different. The person is still being prosecuted. The only thing that's different is that the person is not being immediately arrested. And that, of course, is very beneficial to the police department because they're not, set, you know, their officers aren't losing hours waiting to book someone, process someone, et cetera. Um, but again, in, and I'll, I'll I'll stop for now. But uh, you know, I if you have questions, I, I can ans uh, answer your questions, provide whatever information you want. But we can get that process up and running. I think it would be extremely beneficial under the current environment that we have right now with what's going on with the COVID virus. It would be very useful if that could be done. One other thing that I'll tell you is um, the police department probably has a majority of the arrest and the cases that come into the court system. But at the moment, there are smaller, you know, some of the smaller police departments are already employing some form of the site and release. So what happens with a lot of the smaller uh, police departments like Horizon, Anthony, uh, a lot of the sheriff's department's cases actually, uh, someone will get stopped, they'll be investigated, they'll find marijuana on them, but instead of arresting them at that point, what they'll do is they'll go ahead and let them go and then they'll submit that case to the district attorney's office. And then the district attorney's office will get it uh, set up, processed, and then they'll file it with the court. Once it's filed with the court, then the court issues a warrant and then that person eventually is arrested. So that's somewhat of a form of the site and release. Site and release would be a little different because instead of a warrant being issued, what would be issued uh, would be a summons. And uh, then those people would be brought into court uh, and to see how this, the state wants to prosecute the case. I mean, in any given case, uh, the state could decide to prosecute vigorously or they could decide to offer some kind of uh, deal that allows a person to resolve uh, their case in a way that maybe doesn't affect them down the road. But that would be a decision that would be up to the district attorney's office. They would get to make that decision after they reviewed the facts of the case, after they reviewed the person's record uh, and whatever else they thought was pertinent to the decision as to how they were going to proceed with that case. But again, I wanna emphasize that we are able to get that process up and running and we can get that process up and running uh, just as soon as the relevant players tell us that they wanna use it. And you know, a lot of it's gonna be discussion as, okay, this is one suggestion, what do you think about that? Or it, there's different ways to do it. And it's just a matter of what's gonna work best and what each of the various parties prefer but we can get that up and running. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, 
stop for now. But uh, if you have more questions, I'm happy to answer all your questions. We have uh, we have five members of council who have requested to speak. Are, are you all through with the presentation? And then I'll start the council. Uh, Chief Allen, are you through? There's a few more slides, Mayor, if we can proceed with that. Okay. All right. If we could come up to the first chance program, there, there you go. Um, in regards to the first chance program, and I want to chime in these thoughts uh, in regards to uh, Judge Morales. Uh, the first chance program allows for the offender to be released at the scene. Um, so that's why we talk about the program mirroring the site and release. We have a process in place that has been in existence for two years. And basically, when they meet their eligibility requirements and these are aligned with our strategic goal in keeping this, uh, the standard for a safe and secure city. We're also able to address repeat offenders. And one of the safeguards in regards to that is that the individual not be on any type of probation or haven't been in the program before. So again, um, this process is in place through the first chance program. And I think Mr. Jaime Esparza would agree that the release is done at the scene for those that are eligible for it. You know, uh, we, the, the, the reason we're talking about the first chance program, just to address that, is that they're very similar to site and release. Uh, I do not agree with Judge Morales's, uh, the way he has uh, characterized the site and release program. What site and release does is it allows the officer not to make the arrest. What first chance program does is you, the officer will not make the arrest. But Judge Morales just told you that you have the city has the infrastructure in order to basically start tomorrow that we could start site and release tomorrow that is incorrect what what if i can try to explain this the for us the system the way the case initiates is with the arrest so when an officer start book somebody then we generate a case file that generates the filing of the charges and then eventually you come to court. So the arrest is real important. Now, under the first chance program, we will still hold you accountable. Judge Morales is incorrect. We will still hold you accountable if you do, if you do not take advantage of the first chance program, then we get a warrant and we will go pick you up and we will make you accountable for the marijuana case. The infrastructure that you would have to get is and I don't do this for the city, but just imagine what happens when you get a traffic ticket. When you get a traffic ticket, the officer writes the ticket, and when he notifies the person who received the ticket, he also notifies city government that the ticket has been issued. And that causes the city to do all sorts of things so that when the, when the person who received the ticket either goes to the ticket window or goes to court, the city is prepared to answer the is prepared to present the evidence they have if the if the charge is contested that is really important to us so when you skip the site and when your site and release skips the arrest that means that the city will have to develop a infrastructure in order to notify the county because we're talking about we're not talking about class c's we're talking about a's a and b's and just for your information, we're not talking about every misdemeanor. We're only talking about possession of marijuana cases, possession of controlled substance that are penalty group 2A, criminal mischief, graffiti, theft, theft of service, contraband into a, a correction facility, and driving with your license suspended. Those are the only charges that the, that the law allows you to cite and release. So you know. But what's really important here is if you do cite and release, then you're going to have to have an, a program of notifying us because what will happen is, let's say uh, someone is given a site and release on a possession of marijuana program, a case. So the so the the arrestee will be told, let's say for example, you have to appear in court in two weeks. Well, while he all the arrestee has to do is appear in court and he has to decide if he's going to plead guilty or fight the charge. But the officer's work still still continues, as in every case. The officer has to re, has to take the contraband. He has to take that contraband and put it in the property office. He still has to make a report, and he still has to file his case. He has to do that 
because when when the arrestee shows up in court, the arrestee is coming to answer the criminal charge, and we have to prepare that criminal charge. We have to have the complaint and information so that when we go to court and the judge pre- and the case is presented to the judge, then we're prepared to either uh, accept his plea of guilty, uh, fi- uh, present evidence if the he if he says that he's not guilty, or in, in situations where we don't think we have the evidence, dismiss the case. But we have to have that we have to have that process to occur. And what site and release will require the city to do is to develop that infrastructure. Right now, on a class A or B, whatever case it is, on a class A or B, the way that infrastructure is, is, is created, the way we get that information is with the arrest. While the officer's on the street, he's doing what he has to do. Once he makes the arrest, then that puts into place a number of, of documents that have to be filed in order for us to be ready to answer the charge. So one, so that the, the arrestee has his due process, and two, for the state, who's the complainant, for the state to be prepared to answer those charges. So site and release is com- it, it's not as simple as, as Judge Morales e- explains it to you. All site and release does is avoid the arrest of the defendant. That's all it does. And under first chance, and the only reason I think the city is discussing first chance is because it's similar to it's similar to site and release because also the officer has the discretion of allowing of allowing the defendant not to be arrested but still answering and still being held accountable. The what we like about first chance is we never have to file that case if if the arrestee completes the program, the case has never been filed. But under site and release, the case will have to be filed because we have to be prepared when that when he comes to court, because you heard Judge Morales very clearly tell you that it's a summons. So he has to come to court, right? Well, I just, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll say this for the last time, if he has to come to court and the officer has released him on the street, how will the county, the state of Texas, how will we know that that arrest even occurred? You will have to you will have to create that infrastructure in conjunction with the county so that we will be able to talk to each other when when site and release is used. It's not that it's not as simple as Judge Morales. And just so you know, I have had this discussion with Judge Morales and I've told him exactly what I told you. And he has repeatedly told me it's very simple, but it's not. I've been doing this for way too long. We have we we in, have thousands of cases that we process, and it is true that about 90% of my business is with the city of El Paso, yeah. and so we know this process. And site release will require the city to come up with a system that I assume you're gonna you're gonna create and pay for in order to notify us so that we can do our work. If not, the case cannot be handled. So, and then I'll let you go on. Uh, if I could respond to that briefly, because there's a lot of things where Mr. Esparza said that I had incorrect and I, I would disagree. Um, first thing that's very important that you understand is first chance program and site and release. It's not a situation where it's one or the other. You can use both of these programs effectively and you should use both both of these programs. Each one does something different. So I think the, the current uh, attempt by uh, the DA's office is to say, we have first chance program, we don't need site and release, it's either one or the other. And that's absolutely not the case. They are intended to deal with different issues. First chance program is for the people who have never been in trouble, who have clean records, and you're trying to help them maintain those clean records. Site and release, it's just a matter of how those cases are going to be processed for the people who don't qualify. Just a couple of quick numbers. I think Mr. Esparza said 484 people had gone through the first chance program. In addition to those 484 people that went through the first chance program, there were an additional uh, 2,205 marijuana cases filed in El Paso County. So it's for those other 2,205 cases that the site and release would uh, would be used. So that's one thing. As far as holding them accountable, I mean, I think Mr. Esparza wants to make it seem like we don't want to hold certain people accountable. It's up to his office how people will be held accountable. So through the first chance program, 
they are held accountable in such a way as to where they avoid an arrest and to where they end up. Uh, and that helps them as far as not having an arrest record. Like Mr. Esparza indicated, there may still be a case number showing that they were investigated, but they won't have an arrest, which could be helpful to that individual who qualifies for that program. Sight and release is different. So the person will be given a summons and then the person will be on the summons, will be in, uh, instructed to uh, show up for court on a particular date, just like they would be on a, on a traffic ticket. When they show up for court, then the case will start moving there, depending on how the state wants to handle the case. Now, he talks about that there's this whole problem about there's no infrastructure as to how the state and the courts are going to be notified. There absolutely is an infrastructure for that. Right now, the first chance program, the state and the courts are notified. There's also what's called non-arrest, which I alluded to earlier. Non-arrest are cases where the police respond out to a, a particular case, and then for whatever reason, uh, they choose not to make an arrest. For the police department, I think a lot of times it involves uh, family violence cases where the, per the alleged uh, perpetrator is not present. But as I was telling you earlier, it also involves case that cases uh, such as possession of marijuana cases where the sheriff's department or the smaller law enforcement agencies make the decision not to prosecute or not to arrest the person immediately. Instead, what they do is they refer it to the DA's office. Once they refer it to the DA's office, which they're gonna do on every single case, whether there's an arrest or not, once it's referred to the DA's office, then the DA's office goes ahead and decides whether or not they're gonna prosecute. When they decide to prosecute, they go ahead and file their paperwork and it gets submitted to the court. The same way that gets done on those non-arrest cases, it can be done on these site and release cases. Just so you know, last year, uh, I believe there were 15, 1,580 non-arrest cases that went through a similar process, this non-arrest process. So if it can work for those 1,580 cases, it could work for the 2,205 cases uh, that you'd be dealing with on site and release for possession of marijuana cases. It can be done. Now, Mr. Esparza also indicates that we've had this conversation, and I would let you know that I, I, I've got to disagree a little bit with Mr. Esparza that we've had this conversation. We discussed, as, we discussed whether or not this could be done or not, but we didn't actually have a conversation about the details because one of the things I was asking Mr. Esparza is, okay, show me where you think there's problems that we have with what we can do as to how we process these cases. And his response to me was, it can't be done. We just don't have the infrastructure. And I asked him for details as to what particularly he was looking for. And the same, it was the same response. We just can't do it. We're not set up to do it. We don't have the infrastructure. So I don't consider that having had the conversation as to whether or not this can work. I guarantee you that if we sit down with the goal of making this work, we can set it up to where it will work, to where all parties involved will think that this is at least a starting starting the, the process. Uh, we may have to tweak it as we do with just about any new uh, uh, program that we institute, just like the first chance program has been tweaked throughout the two, two and a half years that it's been in existence. And that's just to make it better and make it work better. I mean, Mr. Esparza will, will tell you, I mean, the first chance program that started in December of 2017 is probably similar to what's being done now, but there's been various tweaks that have been done to that program to make it work better and more efficiently. Now, the, the site and release, uh, I mean, it, it's, you know, he talks about the infrastructure and you're not set up to, to notify the state and the courts. Uh, I don't believe that's going, that, that's gonna be much of a problem. I know Mr. Esparza says, well, you know, there's a lot more to it. I think a lot more to it is what his office will have to do and how quickly they'll have to do it. But regardless of how quickly they do it or don't do it, the program can still work. So just real quick in a nutshell, the way it works is the police go out, they start investigating a case, they uh, talk to whatever, you know, whoever they're investigating, and then they decide whether or not they're going to go forward with charging the individual. If they decide they want to go ahead and charge the individual, that's a discretionary process that they make out there on the scene. Chief Allen and all of his police officers get to make that decision. If they decide they're gonna go forward with charges, then that person's given a citation and they would be given a date to show up for court. 
Sometime between that court date, uh, the, the time that the person's encountered out on the street and the court date, it, hopefully the state would file charges. That person would show up for court, but let's say the state doesn't file charges before the court date. Well, then what's gonna happen is that person is going to be reset for another court date. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to give the police department and the DA's office dates that they can let these offenders know, okay, we, we, are, we are citing you, uh, we're charging you with possession of marijuana or whatever else they may choose to use it for. Uh, that's allowed under the Code of Criminal Procedure. And they're gonna tell them, okay, you need to show up to court on the last Wednesday of the month. Uh, you're going to county court number seven at one o'clock. And so that person's gonna show up to that court date. And if the case has been filed, then they're going to try to re re uh, reach some kind of resolution. If the case hasn't been filed, then that person is going to be uh, given another court date down the road so that the DA's office will have an opportunity to go ahead and file the case and do whatever they need to do. Uh, Mr. Esparza is correct that there are a lot of other things involved for the police department. There's a lot of other work involved uh, with these cases. It's not just a matter of arrest, but what he fails to tell you is that there are a lot of costs involved also with the arrest. I mean, so if you arrest them, you still have to do all the other things. They still have to process the, the evidence. They still have to file their reports, write up their reports and all of those things. But if they actually choose to arrest someone immediately, say for this possession of marijuana case, they have to take them in, they have to do their reports immediately, they may have to take them down to the jail, they may have to stand around while the person is in line to be booked, which could be anywhere from a couple of hours to four or five hours, that's time they're losing off the streets, which could be avoided uh, if they were using the site and release program. And, and I know uh, Chief Allen recognizes the uh, benefit of having his officers be able to use this in particular cases, maybe not all cases. Uh, I mean, that's a that's really a decision that's up to him, but I know he recognizes the, the benefit of having his officers out on the street enforcing other case, other, you know, possibly more serious offenses and, uh, you know, not being, uh, n not standing around waiting at the jail uh, for four or five hours while someone's being booked or you know, even at the police station for one or two or three hours while they're processing paperwork and waiting for someone, uh, you know, the, the, the van that comes and picks them up and takes them to the jail. Uh, there's definite benefit in, in not having his officers do that and they instead be out, on, out in the field. So uh, those are just a couple of things that I, I wanted to clear up. And again, you know, the process is already working. The same process that is used for the first chance program can be instituted and used for the site and summons program. The same program that is being used for the non-arrest cases can be used for the site and summons program. It's just a matter of all, of all of us getting together and coming up with the process that we want to use uh, to go ahead and, and, and start using site and summons. Thank you. If, if this is uh, Chief yes, Allen, sir. if I could chime in here. Go ahead, Chief. Go ahead. Well, well, I agree I, with uh, everything the judge and the, Mr. Esparza said, but this is a, a burden on the police department when the only thing being different is body going into the county jail. So the paperwork process is the problem where, that we have where this doesn't become a time-saving uh, in any sort of imagination here because the only thing that's being substituted is the citation rather than the person going into booking. That's one of the reasons why we have the transportation company. Uh, right now, we have limited hours that the transportation company works, which limits the availability of that particular aspect of doing the, the booking process that could be enhanced, if anything, to save officers time. So basically what I'm saying is this is not a time-saving element for us because that paper has to be done, as Mr. Esparza said, we have to create a document that he can take and prosecute this individual with later. The downside of it is that if we create the uh, criminal history for this person by giving them the citation, you're taking the discretion away from an officer again in the field. Officers on a daily basis make discretionary calls on small amounts of, of marijuana 
for instance, doesn't even get the citation or go into the first chance program as a, an example. This is something that citing and releasing does. It creates a criminal history for everyone. And it's not, again, I have to repeat, it's not a time-saving element for us, if that's what people are looking at and doing. Is that the end of the presentations? We have a lot of people. Yes. Yes, sir. Is there public comment, Mayor? Yeah, yes, Representative. For, I'm getting to that next. First, we'll do public comment, and then we'll have the rest of the uh, the, the um, five of you that want to speak. All right, Laura, let's do public comment. Yes, Mayor. The first person that signed up to speak is Mr. Mal Laura. Garcia. Okay. Laura. Yes, sir. Before you do that, um, is is there um, is, is Representative is, uh, Representative Moody? Yes, sir. Representative Moody is is in the queue waiting to speak. Would well, you like him to was, go first? He, he, well, as part of this presentation, uh, the the director from the council was to seek input for all, from all the stakeholders, and that's the reason the judge was uh, a part of the presentation. Uh, Representative Moody is part of those stakeholders that was directed by the council, so he's part of the presentation. So if he can add to the presentation, um, would you please let him do so? I, I don't think he's he's part of the stakeholder process that we told council we were going to do. So he, he can comment on the presentation in its entirety. Okay. Representative Moody, sir, if you'll press star six, you can unmute your microphone and begin speaking. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I appreciate the, uh, the, the opportunity um, uh, to speak. I certainly appreciate, um, I think it was Mr. Gonzalez, um, you know, certainly recognizing me as a stakeholder in this. I mean, last time I checked, I'm a taxpaying El Paso and as well. Um, worked on criminal justice policy for over a decade in this state. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this conversation. So I'm very grateful that um, they give me this opportunity. I, I just want to touch on on a few things. Uh, you know, reading through the resolution that dates back to November, the, the task that was assigned by council was to show council what a site and summons or site and release policy would look like. Uh, I read the presentation that has been presented to you uh, once it was posted online, uh, I mean, you asked someone to do A and they came back to you with B. Uh, nothing in this presentation shows you what site and release would look like in El Paso. In fact, the only one that seems like they are attempting to show you what it would look like, and again, it, it would be, I will, I will give you that it takes infrastructure to set up this process that is different than what we do. That point is a given. The task was show me what that looks like, and it sounds like Judge Morales is letting you know what that would look like with the current constructs as someone who has been in the intake department in the district attorney's office and had cases brought to him in a system called quote unquote regular route regular route cases where cases brought to us that were non-arrest i mean why do you think we had that name for it uh in, anyway like there is an infrastructure piece to this that's not lost on me it shouldn't be lost on anybody dealing with this to say that it's to say that it is to say that the answer to come back is we can't do this we won't do this um, I, I don't know uh, I don't know how that's an acceptable response when the task was show me what this looks like in the city of El Paso uh, I've you know, I've certainly seen uh, excuses in and around the criminal justice reform movement for for a decade so it's not not surprising um, uh, to me at this point uh, and I think you know the pr prior conversation uh, this morning really kind of i mean just made the point even broader to me we felt that citations for violating health orders were sufficient but citations for low-grade possession is, is not though that that kid's got to go to jail the disconnect between those two discretionary pieces couldn't be any wider. 
I, I, I'm not saying that you should have thrown those folks in jail. In fact, I think citation probably was the best way to handle that scenario. But if it works there and we have the ability to do it there, then to me, it stands to reason that we can put our minds together and figure out how to do it for low level offenses. This doesn't touch a myriad of offenses. Uh, as was pointed out, there's only seven in these categories and you can actually fashion it however you want to. If you don't want to do five of those seven or six of those seven, you don't have to. Uh, San Marcos just last week passed a policy that embraced all seven. You don't have to, that's their choice. That's what, that's, that's what this report was supposed to come back and say. Um, look, I'm not a member of city council. I don't, you know, I certainly think you all have a very difficult job to do. Um, we deal with a myriad of state agencies at the legislature. Uh, if I ever task the state agency to research and come back with recommendations on something and, and the recommendation was uh, completely non-responsive, uh, I, I don't know that I'd be very, um, I don't know that I'd be very uh, uh, happy with that agency. But at any rate, uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, and um, appreciate, I, I really do sincerely appreciate uh, Mr. Gonzalez allowing me to be part of the uh, presentation. Uh, uh, very, very gracious of him. Thank you. All right, let's 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 move to the other uh, public comment. Yes, Mayor, we have several members of the public that signed up to speak. I will remind the audience that this time is for public comment. You will receive three minutes. Uh, this is not a time for personal attacks, political statements, or campaigning. If you fail to follow the guidelines, you will forfeit your turn to speak, and we will move on to the next speaker. And I thank you in advance for respectfully participating in local government. The first person that I see in the queue is Mr. Um, James. Ms. Fry, sorry, Ms. Fry, um, I know that there are some people signed up for public comment who have been um, really invested in this process, and I know they have a lot to say, so I would like to make a, make a motion to suspend the rules for this item. Um, and extend that three minutes. I would hope council would uh, remain with the three minutes until we second. decide we need to. Did, did you second that, Representative Hernandez? Yes, sir. Okay, let's vote. Okay, Representative Anello, how long would you like to give the public? I mean, how many people are signed up to speak? We have uh, 14 people. No, I would say six minutes. Six minutes, okay. So there's a motion and a second to suspend the rules of order to allow each member of the public to speak for six minutes. On that motion, Mayor Pro Tem Schwartzbein. Aye. Representative Anello. Aye. Representative Hernandez. Yes. Representative Morgan. Yes. Representative Salcido. Aye. Representative Rodriguez. Yes. Representative Rivera? Sure. Representative Lizarga? Aye. That motion passes unanimously, so each member of the audience will have up to six minutes if they need six minutes to speak. The first person in the queue is Mr. James Peinado. Sir, if you'll press star six to unmute your telephone, you may begin speaking up to six minutes. Star six, Mr. Peinado. We'll move on to the next speaker, Ms. Diana Camarena. If you'll press star six, you can unmute your telephone and begin speaking. Good afternoon, ma'am. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, City Council and Mayor DeMargo. My name is Diana Camarena. I come uh, here today to show my support of the site and relief program in El Paso. I don't think it's humane to tell a city, to tell a community of people that their city will take a step forward and be one of the cities joining Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, and San Marcos, in which it is not now along, and then try to take a step back. Let's remember that the Texas legislature passed a law in 2007 that allows a site and relief policy to be implemented. This was 13 years ago. It has, take us, it has to take us this long to move forward and accept something that the Texas legislature saw coming 13 years ago. 
San Marcos is now the first Texas city to pass site and release law, something I've been seeing all over the news, giving San Marcos the attention they wanted and deserve. El Paso needs to prove to others that we are not falling behind. You, city council, voted in support of site and release back in November. We as a city love to move forward, so why take a step back now? Our city is growing and needs to continue growing in all aspects. I despise seeing anyone take a step back, so you can imagine seeing El Paso try to take a step back, how that makes me feel. More than that, it makes me feel sad for our city. I did some research and I found something interesting. I'm sure you've heard it before. I found Time Magazine named as El Paso as one of the five least literate cities published in 2014. That means as a city, we don't read much. We don't motivate reading as a society as much as we should. And therefore, we follow El Paso yard sales or El Paso car sales pages more than we do the El Paso public library page. Our level of knowledge as a city could then be reflected through our literacy rate, which then would mean we have a very low level of knowledge in different areas as a city. So I looked more, a little more into it, and I found an article by 247wallstreet.com that listed the 10 most and least literate cities in the United States. The list of the most literate cities had nine out of 10 cities that were within states that had legalized cannabis in some way, none of which included any place in Texas. However, the least literate list included three Texas cities, one of which is El Paso. So do we wait until others lead the way, or do we go forward and prove we are not who they say we are? As city council and mayor, I know that your literacy rate is not represented in what the city is, which is why you are a part of city council and mayor. You are the voice for all of our citizens, and you are the ones that protect them in all aspects. You're the ones they pay attention to because they were told to. But that's why, as a senior at UTEP studying education, I like to further my own education and educate others. One of Hitler's ideas during the Holocaust was to take away all books to remove education because a society that was educated would know all the wrong he was doing towards them. He thought it was okay to do it to people that didn't know any better. It didn't make it okay. Because our city doesn't know any better, doesn't make it okay. I want everyone to know that El Paso is growing. Their literacy rate is growing because it's only natural for a growing city to keep growing and keep learning. So why are we going back? Let's grow the education within the community, not the fear and the stigma. Fear that some people want to be there. I came to speak before you today to tell you that the cannabis community is educating others and we know it no longer comes down to what is right and unharmful, but it comes down to finances. Nobody's life should be ruined by cannabis. No children should be traumatized from seeing an arrest over something unharmful. Just because this is new doesn't mean it can't be done. So I support sight and release for the city of El Paso and I look forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Colt DeMorris. Mr. DeMorris, if you'll press star six, you can unmute your telephone. And Mr. DeMorris did drop off a presentation in my office this morning. IT, will you please bring up his presentation? Good afternoon, Council, Mayor, and all of those joining us. Um, I can't see the screen. Can you let me know when the presentation is up? It's up, Mr. DeMorris. You can go ahead. Okay. Can you please go to slide two? Good afternoon, Council. Um, I keep hearing Ms. that on, we Mr. don't Morris. have the. It, okay. Ms. Morris, hold on. Ms. Prime, I, I oh. don't have a presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's Nor do the, I. I don't see anything either, but I want to tell Representative Rivera hello. Okay, can you see it now? Well, I, I, um, I don't have the video. Yes, but okay. I can see it. Okay, thank you. Okay, cool. We do. So we can, we're good? Yes, we're on slide two. Okay. Um, and that's the one that starts off Harris County? Yes, correct. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, Council, Mayor, everybody involved. Um, I keep hearing that we don't have the infrastructure, that we can't do this. Um, I've heard it for five years. Um, that makes me feel like El Paso's incompetent. We're not incompetent. And because if other jurisdictions in Texas can do it, so can we. Um, if you look at the slide, you see the biggest counties throughout Texas, the biggest jurisdictions, Harris County, Bexar County, the city of Dallas, even the Texas DPS is doing it. 
uh, the city of Austin, uh, Corpus Christi down in Nueces County, and the city of San Marcos. Uh, some of these programs have been going on for years, more of a more recent, like the city of San Marcos. The common factor here is that none of these jurisdictions have reversed course and said that they made a mistake. They have all ended arrests for misdemeanor marijuana possession. And with uh, Harris County leading the way, I sent you guys a video this morning uh, with uh, District, Attorney, uh, District Attorney Kim Ogg. I wanted to put the video in here, but I was unable. Um, if you could go to slide three, please. The goal of this policy is to ensure that the limited resources of the court system, local law enforcement, and the El Paso County Jail are used responsibly to increase public safety. Individuals who commit not the non-violent crime of possessing... Excuse me? I was asking IT to... There you go. We're on slide three now. Oh, okay. So the, the, the goal of this policy is to ensure that the limited resources of the court system, local law enforcement, and the El Paso County Jail are used responsibly to increase public safety. Individuals and individuals who commit nonviolent crimes of possessing a misdemeanor amount of marijuana are not stigmatized by a criminal record that limits their employment, education, and housing opportunities and brings on other collateral consequences and also eliminates the wasteful spending of El Paso taxpayer taxpayer funds, especially during the crisis that we're experiencing with COVID-19. If you go to slide four, please. So I have numbers here from 2017 to 2020, or to 2020. Um, in 2017, we arrested a total of 1,724 people for misdemeanor marijuana offenses. That averages out to about 5,172 hours or 517 10-hour shifts of police hour time. The money spent booking those people ranges at about $206,000. In 2018, we had a total of, and this is after the, the first chance program was implemented, we had a total of 1,378 people arrested for misdemeanor marijuana offenses. The amount spent on those was approximately $165,360. You can go to slide five, please. In 2019, we arrested 1,640 people. That's up by about 300 people from the previous year and also still with the First Chance program in place. We wasted about 4,920 police hours or 492 10-hour shifts at the rate of $196,800. In the first months of February and January 2020, we had already arrested 315 people for misdemeanor marijuana offenses. If we were to add the five, day, or the five people a day average, we could add another 150 to that number, and that would, be, that would bring it up to 465. With those first two months, we've already spent $37,000 arresting people for misdemeanor marijuana offenses. Over the last three years, we have arrested 5,057 people. So, um, we've spent 15,171 hours doing paperwork, with the money spent being $606,840. This is not sensible policy. Site and release is sensible policy. Out of all other jurisdictions across Texas that have implemented such policy, none of them have reversed course, as I said earlier. Some of the jurisdictions even went as far as citing and releasing misdemeanor A and B offenses that were all authorized under the law back from back in 2007. This is fiscally responsible, as well as having the ability to, by keeping our streets safer, by keeping officers on the streets. Um, you know, it's not good pulling officers off the streets for three hours doing paperwork and then having them to transport the person down to the jail. We need to keep those on the streets. This is the whole reason that Mothers Against Drunk Driving pushed the law back in 2007 to help get it passed so we could keep our uh, officers on the streets and looking for people that are driving drunk or doing stuff that actually create victims with their crimes. It's time to make the change in El Paso. And, and, uh in November of 2019, you guys voted in favor of the resolution. And instead of voting for the resolution, you guys wanted more information. You guys tasked City Manager Tommy Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. DeMores. You've reached the six-minute limit, sir. Thank you. 
The next speaker will be Mr. Uh, Cedric can Jackson. Can we ask Mr. Demores how many slides are left on his presentation? He reached the end of the presentation, Representative Anello. Okay, great, thank you. The next person is Mr. Cedric Ms. Jackson. Ms. Prime, can you share that, that Colton Morris's presentation with us? When yes, sir, I'll pause. forward to all of mayor and council. Mr. Jackson, if you'll press star six, you can unmute your phone and begin speaking up to six minutes. Hello? Yes, sir, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, greetings. City Council, Mayor, everyone on the call. Um, I don't have slides or numbers, but I'm, I'm part of this community. I've been in this community my whole life. <laughs> I'm Northeast, so I, I can guarantee you there's always some kind of, you know, police presence that needs to be in this, in this side of the town. But like Mr. DeMora said, a lot of, our of the police officer's time is spent dealing with a victimless crime. Like it doesn't hurt anyone outside of the person that is in possession of the marijuana. Um, but when you think about other things like alcohol, which causes a victim every night, almost in El Paso, if not one, many uh, of people just walking, um, people just driving home from work. Um, you, you can already just in the last couple of years see just in the west side where people are getting ran over by drunk drivers, you never hear about uh, this person that was smoking marijuana killed somebody in a fatal car accident. Like that's not what the, the title of any of these deaths ever is. But yeah, we continue to, to go back and rehatch this, that marijuana is this terrible thing. Um, I go back to one of the things I had just seen recently when we were talking about going to the moon they, they, they asked, you know, how do we get to the moon? What do we need? And really, we just need the willingness to do it. And from what I'm hearing, a lot of these people that are against it just don't have the willingness to try. When you say we can't or, or it's not possible, like anything's possible to be done if you have the willingness to try and do it, as you can see throughout the different cities in Texas and, and different states in the United States of America that are going forward with something that the people want. It's not that the people don't want it. And then when you talk about your, your policy for the first chance, who does that help? That helps children or, 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 or I guess 17 to 20 year olds. Cause you got to think about, I'm 40 years old. I got a possession charge when I was 18. How many people in, in El Paso are like that? You know, it doesn't really benefit anyone to have that. I think the best idea, because I'm for the site and release, hand out tickets. Just like the, the judge was saying, it still gives you a track record of what someone's done. It's right. It, if you get a ticket for speeding, that doesn't disappear just because you paid the fine. It's still right there. So I don't really have too much to say uh, other than, yes, I'm definitely for the site and release because it, it benefits everyone, not, not just, you know, kids or, or adults or it benefits everybody it benefits the city it benefits the police department and it benefits the people uh thank you very much you guys have a great day thank you the next speaker is mr bruce grego he will be followed by mr michael castro mr grego if you'll press star six you can unmute your phone and begin speaking up to six minutes afternoon councilman <laughs> thank you um afternoon councilman uh mayor DiMargo. Uh, Joe Moody. My name is Bruce Griego, and I am an Army veteran who suffers from a traumatic brain injury. Short-term memory loss, ability to remain, retain information, PTSD, depression, and anxiety. I also suffer from chronic pain such as three herniated discs, migraines, joint pains, and acute arthritis. I have overcome addictions brought on by opiates and benzos. At one point, I was on 13 different medications, nine for PTSD, depression, anxiety, and nightmares. Three of them were to counteract the side effects of the other nine, and one, uh, and one other medication was for migraines that could and were triggered by such a high dosage of medication. During that time of medication I was taking, I also suffered from three chemically induced seizures in 2015 and 2016, what is also known as serotonin syndrome. 
Since then, I've chosen to medicate with cannabis and have decreased my medication reg regimen down to just one single medication. I am not asking you to understand how this has helped me scientifically, but morally. El Paso Police Department has continued to arrest individuals for cannabis possession, while me and along with others here feel that their time, meaning the police officers, and efforts could be allocated elsewhere. Not to mention all the hours and money saved by booking and processing someone in our county jail for such simple possession. I hope you would consider cite and release as much as I do. Nobody here is asking you today to legalize our plant, but to simply implement cite and release and stop arresting El Paso citizens. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Michael Castro. He will be followed by Mr. Christopher Hernandez. Mr. Castro, star six, sir, to unmute your phone, and you may begin speaking up to six minutes. Good afternoon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you, Mr. Castro. Go ahead. Okay, awesome. Good afternoon, City Council. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so real quick, marijuana being an essential business but federally illegal is really such a poetic representation of how disconnected the federal government is from the people's needs. Um, cannabis during COVID-19, dispensaries all over the country were deemed essential businesses, meaning people who get paid to grow cannabis in this country are at work growing and selling marijuana. My friends and coworkers in Colorado that I have worked with over the past six years are at work right now growing cannabis. Cannabis marijuana has been, has been deemed essential to life in states where it is legal during COVID-19. Recreational and medical dispensaries are open in every single legal and medical state in this country. They have had the dispensaries open since day one of the crisis, but yet we still decide to arrest for possession. Now, Police Chief Greg Allen, District Attorney, and some council members think that the first chance program is enough for this city and is enough for our people to have a second chance in life because you guys consider having cannabis in our possession a crime, a mistake. But out of the 308 people arrested for possession of cannabis under two ounces the first two months of 2020, January and February, only 35 of those people qualified for the first chance program. You guys profile us because you smell marijuana coming from the home. You smell marijuana coming from the car. You guys are arresting people for marijuana and you can't even 100% prove if it is legal CBD hemp flower, CBD oil, or a CBD vape pen. Keep in mind, CBD products are sold in every single smoke shop across El Paso. If any, if any law enforcement, Greg Allen, this attorney, if you guys need me to take you to a smoke shop so you can see all the CBD products that are available in El Paso, let me do so. The city of El Paso is still arresting people for cannabis marijuana in today's age is injustice and is not justice at any level. You can't define what is legal and not legal. If the person you are arresting has high THC cannabis, which is easily available and accessible here in El Paso, how can you tell me the percentage of the product that you are arresting that individual for if you don't have the equipment to do so? You can't test THC percentage. You can't even test CBD percentages. So I'm assuming guilty before proven innocent is an okay and real thing in this city. Council, police chief, everyone, if you Google legal cannabis states, states that are legal in this country, they are literally surrounding Texas. You step one step across any state line that borders Texas, and you are now in a green state. Cannabis is not hard to find in this city, and I don't know how many times I have to tell you guys that. Cannabis marijuana in this, is in the city, and you guys will do nothing to stop it from coming into the city. And no, it's not coming from Mexico. The cannabis marijuana you are arresting people for in this city is coming from the legal states in the United States of America, and that is a fact. You haven't stopped it in over 115 years since 1905, and that is a fact. Because if you did stop it, there wouldn't be a 90% conviction and arrest rate for nonviolent marijuana offenses in this city. How is it that a city has had a 90% conviction and arrest rate for nonviolent marijuana possession charges, and there is an arrest rate percentage of 35% for burglary, rape, auto theft, home theft, domestic abuse, breaking and entering, 
And you guys only have a 35% arrest rate, not a conviction rate. That tells me that in this city, people are sitting in jail. The people sitting in jail in this city are 70% more likely to be in there because they had cannabis, marijuana in their possession. But hey, keep arresting people for what you think, what the law says is a crime. Except the law says it is not a crime to possess or to grow your own plants or to even work in cannabis facilities growing thousands of cannabis plants. No laws are broken in California, Colorado, New Mexico, and other states that border Texas. I can go on. There's 33 medical states and 11 recreational states. But yet El Paso, Texas, the first city in the entire country in 1905, 115 years ago, Council, is still having a hard time deciding whether or not it is a good idea to stop arresting for nonviolent crime. Fight and release needs to be implemented ASAP in our city, and the first chance program and arresting people for cannabis is not even close to being justice. It is unfair and already a broken system. Let me state that again. There has been 308 arrests made for possession under two ounces and seven arrests made for possession over four ounces of cannabis, marijuana in the first two months of January and February 2020. Out of 315 individuals, only 35 of those individuals were offered the first chance program. 35. Thank you, guys. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Christopher Hernandez. He will be followed by Ms. Valerie Hubbard. Mr. Hernandez, star six, to unmute your telephone, and you may begin speaking up to six minutes. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. First, let me thank you for your 6-2 vote on November 12th in favor of a site and release program. I am not here to argue the morals of marijuana, whether it is good or bad, nor am I here to argue the science of marijuana, whether it is healthy or not. I am not here in favor of legalization, for that is outside the purview of counsel. I am speaking to you today as a citizen concerned for our public safety. I am happy to speak to you about this because all of you have made clear public safety is your number one priority. Arresting individuals for small misdemeanor possession of marijuana takes our peace officers out of our communities for an average of four hours per arrest in a city where response times are already too long. Please consider the following. Driving above the speed limit is against the law because it puts lives at risk. But we do not hold our citizens accountable by arresting for speeding violations. We do it by citing offenders and having offenders appear in court at a later date. And we do not start arresting on a second or third time offense for speeding. And as we learned earlier today, offenders may not even be cited at the time of a violation. They can be cited at a later date, even when putting public health in danger. The thing should be the same with misdemeanor possession of marijuana. This is why our city council back in November voted in favor of a site and release program. Site and release should be enforced on anyone whether it's the first offense or not and sight and release does not take away the first chance program it should also be noted that mr Espasa will no will soon no longer be the da as mr Espasa elected not to run for re-election both candidates currently in the runoff election for district attorney are supportive of sight and release similar measures have already been done in dallas houston san antonio and austin and now san marcos so saying it cannot be done is wrong we are asking that officers have no ability to arrest for a small possession of marijuana. They may have discretion between citing and not citing, especially in conjunction with the first task program. I would like to thank all police officers for their service to our community. However, with all due respect to all, I must remind the public that the chief of police does not set policy. Our peace officers are to enforce the law made by the representatives who are elected by the citizens they serve. That's the state law allows for sight and release for misdemeanor offenses, and our city council voted 6-2 to two in favor of a sight and release program for possession of marijuana. It is important we implement this program as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Ms. Valerie Hubbard. She will be followed by Ms. Jessica Valderas. Ms. Hubbard, star six, to unmute your phone, and you may begin speaking up to six minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council, and thank you for waiting around for this very important 
presentation on site and release. My name is Valerie Hubbard. I am here in support of site and release. Cannabis is not a criminal justice issue. Cannabis is a public health issue. In close to two thirds to three quarters of the United States, cannabis is being recommended by doctors as an adjunct medicine for their patients right now, today. If I'd known I had six minutes to speak, I would have really prepared for this because I've timed myself down and you should be glad for that. <laughs> okay, the program before you that is supported by law enforcement community, First Chances, is a revenue drain for city resources. It's a time drain for law enforcement. I hope, I hope I didn't turn you off with my excited ear. Are you still there? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, site and release would create a revenue stream for El Paso. It should be treated similar to a parking ticket. Under two ounces. Un two ounces or under is a misdemeanor small amount of cannabis. A person should be given a ticket. They can mail in whatever that particular amount cost is that they deem on them, or they can go into court, but it shouldn't be uh, have to do another uh, law enforcement program. Uh, if we can't get, if we can't move forward at this point with decriminalization, then I'm asking the city council to please vote yes for site and release. Vote yes for the citizens of El Paso, please do something good and remove cannabis from your law enforcement issues. You have better things to do. I thank you so much. Appreciate all of law enforcement. Thanks for the time to speak, and thanks for the afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. The next speaker is Ms. Jessica Valdera. She will be followed by Mel Garcia. Ms. Valdera, star six, to unmute your telephone, and you may begin speaking up to six minutes. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it and I won't take the whole six minutes. Actually, I don't even think I'll take two minutes. It's very simple. I am here in favor of side and relief. Um, simple fact is that it's a frivolous situation to spend so much time, money and effort on somebody that's carrying, for example, a gram of marijuana. No criminal offense, has never done anything wrong. I just feel like it's wasting too much time, money, and manpower on something that is really not or shouldn't be um, considered a crime because <laughs> it's just like carrying chamomile. It's a plant. And so for me, I think you guys have a lot of better things to do um, with addressing real issues and real concerns rather than spending so much time and focusing on something as petty as marijuana. That's all I have to say. Thank you, guys. Thank you. The next speaker is Mel Garcia, followed by Mr. Nicholas Vasquez. Mel Garcia, if you please press star six, you can unmute your telephone and begin speaking up to six minutes. Good afternoon. Hi, good, good afternoon. This is Mel Garcia. I'm calling in favor for site and release. So let me explain to you why. I'm a New Mexican, but I work in Texas, and so I have a medical cannabis card. And let me tell you that it's been so helpful to be able to have medicine um, available to me in my state, but because we're a bordering state, I mean, El Paso should really get on the ball and understand that this is just a plant. This is a medicinal plant. We are a bordering neighbor to New Mexico, and they have actually seen such benefits as in helping individuals who have anxiety, PTSD, and there's no need to be wasting taxpayers' dollars on the police force arresting individuals for small quantities of cannabis. I mean, if you all do the study, there's so much studies in different states and how beneficial it helps individuals. And it doesn't benefit the city to be wasting our manpower arresting individuals for no apparent reason for this plant that is being um, you utilized for medicinal purposes. And to waste manpower, especially during the corona situation, I mean, there's so much more where officers could be needed and, be dis and dispersed of versus arresting and wasting time and manpower and tax dollars that the 
the El Paso citizens could utilize for something better, like using that money to buy better PPE for medical professionals in the hospitals. I think that that needs to be taken into consideration and understand that El Paso is so much better than that. They've always been um, on the forefront of doing so many good things for their citizens. Why not show that you are able to be positive and optimistic and showing that El Paso is going to move forward and move away from arresting individuals for cannabis because, and the terminology of marijuana is unnecessary. This is cannabis, it's a medicinal plant, and it has so many benefits. And so I think, in my personal opinion, El Paso needs to stop arresting individuals and cite and release is very beneficial. And so I'm not going to take all the six minutes, but I would hope that the city council members would understand that this is so needed and for El Paso citizens and the police officers wasting their time arresting individuals is beyond words. Thank you so much for your time and your, after and your afternoon. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Nicholas Vasquez. He will be followed by Javier Gutierrez. Mr. Vasquez, star six, sir, to unmute your telephone and you may begin speaking up to six minutes. Good afternoon. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, I just want to go ahead and take my time to really, uh, I know, just thank uh, Peter Swartzfine, District 1, Representative Anello, as well as Hernandez. And I do want to go ahead and state that I'm glad that you're sticking towards your ground. I mean, realistically, the city government is always responsive towards city representatives. So please don't let the mayor or manager ever bully you guys. You guys are in control. So with that being said, I mean, I kind of just want to go ahead and kind of hammer in on the point that was previously made about, you know, it's kind of weird hearing public entities or public officials say that it's a hard job because when you see that it's public money that pays these types of individuals to do a certain job, it, it, it's weird because I mean, as far as the, the current DA is going to be out of the office, so I'm not too sure why he's concerned about hard work when, again, there was another individual that stated that the two candidates for the DA race are in favor of site and release. So, again, to try to take in consideration his, um, his opinion, it kind of blanks or it kind of doesn't really register to me to decide that that's actually like a logical solution to choose because, again, I mean, you're not going to be dealing with Heimer Sparza. You might be dealing with one of the two candidates in the current DA race. And again, as Mr. Vasquez, else, the state of let me interrupt you, sir. This is current. not for political statements or campaigning or oh, personal no, attacks. Political statements, ma'am. Again, if you listen to my words, all I'm just saying is that, you know, I don't understand how Heimer Sparza, the current DA, has like a lot of authority to say that, you know, it's going to be hard to enforce when, again, the two individuals are in the current race for the DA seat are in favor of deciding release. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll stop with there, but again, you know, the other thing that I'm kind of a little bit upset about is that there was a mentioning that the, uh, the smelling or the use of marijuana is a way to go ahead and point out other criminal activity. And I'm kind of wondering to know that, is that what police always rely on? Because if I'm not mistaken, I think there are, there are other ways to go ahead and look to inquire if other criminal activity is happening. You know, again, I'm still trying to go ahead and figure out why the emphasis of, you know, I think it was a chief alley now stating that police officers use that as a discretionary to try to go ahead and inquire about more criminal activity. There are other ways to go ahead and, I guess, see their profile, if you, if you want to call it that way, or try to go ahead and see if there's other criminal activity happening. I mean, again... I, I can't really say too much about the medical benefits, but those are some of the things I just want to go ahead and hammer on, is that when you're making your decision, please just know that individuals that are on the table right now won't be on the table because there are current elections happening. And as the other individual stated previously before me, both candidates are in support of a siding release. And again, please, I'm not too sure why I keep hearing this rhetoric of marijuana associated with criminal activity it's 2020, and I'm sure that there are a lot of you guys, even representatives, that know people that utilize marijuana for medicinal uses. I mean, I'll share a little bit about myself. I, um, I got in an accident. I snapped my neck, and, you know, it's really hard to move. And, you know, I'm in a lot of physical pain, and having to go ahead and, you know, decide if I want to go ahead and take some pain medication, opioids, 
and possibly get addicted to it, but yet, you know, take these things to go ahead and, you know, go about my daily routine. I, it kind of, it kind of hurts me because, you know, I don't want to become another statistic of that opioid crisis. So, you know, marijuana has allowed me to try to go ahead and live somewhat of a normal life that I can. And, you know, my case isn't different from any others. I mean, mine could probably even be lesser than others. You know, everyone always goes through life with hard times. So I, I'm just wanting to go ahead and just, you know, just tell you guys, please support Saturday release. Long story short is that, you know, you got to go ahead and say that the first chance is going to solve this whole problem is not the correct solution to do. I think it requires both the first chance and the side release. Because, again, each case varies and it depends. So, again, there may be a person that has marijuana that is partaking in criminal activity. But again, that could be handled at the appropriate time and measures. Because again, there could be another individual that uses marijuana for medicinal uses. Because again, pain medication and opioid medication has been shown to be addictive and cause a lot of medical problems, which then could even cause medical bills to rise. And, you know, I'm not too sure if you guys smoke. I would highly recommend you smoke a blunt. It's $10 a G, $15, depending on who you buy. And see how you feel. See how your problems go away. I think that maybe if you guys have smoked a blunt prior before, a lot of attention regarding the whole enforcing of a public mandate, which I'm still trying to even figure out about how that relates to constitutional rights just to simply wear a mask. But again, I think that if you guys have maybe just smoked, you guys could have probably, you know, handled that a little bit better. But I do, again, just appreciate you guys' time. I want to go ahead and thank you guys for even allowing many individuals to go ahead and go and speak for at least six minutes. So thank you so much for doing what you're doing and just please do correct me. The next speaker is Mr. Javier Gutierrez. He will be followed by Francisco Ramirez. Mr. Gutierrez, if you're on the line, please press star six to unmute your phone and you may begin speaking up to six minutes. Javier Gutierrez. We'll move on to Francisco Ramirez. Mr. Ramirez, star six to unmute your phone. Good afternoon. Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, this is Francisco Ramirez. Uh, yes, I, I love exactly how the previous person stated that uh, I'm, I'm also for and release as well that if people would actually try cannabis and I, I'm not necessarily saying to smoke it because there's many different ways to put it on so I used to be a teacher at Western Technical College for automotive uh, last year and I of course we can't use cannabis here in Texas so I would use CBD I eventually got into the, the CBD business because I did notice the opioid crisis because of course as we know Western Technical College has plenty of students that are you know, using the money for, for educational purposes. And many of these students that are in the military, I, I would see them and when they come in because obviously their back is in pain because of all the equipment that they're needing to actually carry on their person to do their job. And they would come in, I mean, and the prescriptions necessarily say they cannot drive and cannot do anything that maybe uh, that they, they need to have motor skills to, to operate the faces of the business they need to do and when they would come into class I would see them their face their color and their skin is different and it was hard for them to pay attention so as soon as I introduced them of course when they got out of out of the military I introduced them to the CBD and boy did it change the way they thought the way they felt they didn't have to feel drowsy on it so cannabis in general also would have studied a little bit more on it CBD is obviously just a portion of the plant from either hemp or cannabis but in this case, we're talking about cannabis, which has a high level of THC. But if you want an equal amount of like one to one, it's actually beneficial as a medical use. Of course, I'm not a medical expert, but as far as I've seen, uh, just CBD alone helped my students even pay attention, even for myself, because I was actually, you know, giving it to uh, sampling it to some of the teachers, and it would actually help them with their stress levels, pain levels. I mean. 
I even I would even sell at the at the farmers market. So even just CBD alone, a lot of the officers came up to our booth and were asking questions because I mean they would explain to us, yeah, they have a a high uh, anxiety type of job, so they're always you know not just not just paperwork. They do I mean they do a lot of important actions that that they need to support our community. So they're always in stress. Excuse me. They're always stressed out. So when they actually try the CBD and they actually go around on their bikes, they're like, oh, wow, this is actually, this is crazy because you know what? They, they say a lot of them probably have taken, partaken before cannabis. They know what it's for. And then they were actually teaching some of the officers that, you know, that never even tried it off. Of course, you're taught and indoctrinated to understand that this thing is, it's, it's a bad plant, but it's actually something grown from the ground that actually has supported and been used for thousands of years. And teaching them, I think it's a lot of it has to be with education. You don't necessarily need to be high and be, of course, incapacitated. You can't get so high where you can't do anything. But to a level where it, it can actually help with pain and help, and help with uh, neurological issues like MS, fibromyalgia, because those are the clients that actually hit with CBD, and it, it helps them tremendously instead of having to use some type of opioids and actually get addicted to that. And those have a higher side effect, of course, when you see all the advertisements on TV. There's many different side effects. So I, I actually would prefer people using something that would actually would help and have minor amount of side effects and have less chemicals in their body when this is more natural. And plus, cops have, I mean, our, our peace officers have more, better, better and bigger things to base, basically fish and fry on. So that's what I would suggest, and that's basically what, what I like to propose to you guys. And just, just see it. I mean, like the other person said, I would honestly suggest try a little bit, a little bit, because I actually have my card. I was able to actually get my card from New Mexico as an El Paso resident. So, of course, I do my business on that side. But you can see the difference within people that actually have pain and, and some type of neurological issue or anxiety. So I, I think it helps out a lot. So I think just... Like what the other person said, you don't necessarily have to smoke it. There's many ways topically, uh, edibly, vaping and smoking. And vaping and smoking are completely different things if you look that up. But those are basically my, my two senses, and that's what I propose to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Raul Moran. Sir, if you're on the line, star six to unmute your phone. Raul Moran. James Peinado, star six, if you would like to speak. James Peinado, Raul Moran, or Javier Gutierrez. Good afternoon, Mr. Peinado. Hi, uh, sorry I missed the first call, but thank you for a second chance. Uh, I'm a rep resident of uh, District 1, Cici Lazarga. I'd really like to know what her views are on this. I'm, often not hearing her speak up on these issues. But um, in any case, uh, I really want to thank you guys for uh, having this discussion. And uh, after hearing uh, pros and cons of site and release versus the first chance program, I think that uh, the site and release program is the better option for El Paso, Texas. Uh, personally, I don't really think uh, people should be held accountable for something that is a victimless crime. Um, I don't actually use cannabis, but I really can't justify enforcing something upon somebody else when I drink alcohol and use dip Copenhagen tobacco. Um, I'm sure many people on the city council also uh, enjoy a glass of wine or smoke a cigar every now and then. And so uh, the, today's city council has a unique opportunity to do a really great thing for the people of El Paso by just obviously... You know, legalizing it is beyond this city council's ability, but uh, we can decriminalize something and uh, benefit from a bit of uh, economic prosperity that can uh, spurn from this decision. Um, you are not uh, creating an arrest record, which will, uh, I think, greatly benefit people going forward. Uh, arrest records, you know, make it more difficult for people to uh, rent out apartments and get jobs. And so uh, this war on drugs really does have a heavy impact on human potential. 
And now in this pandemic, uh, with so much imposed economic restrictions, uh, it has never been more crucial to look for creative ways to untap and release as much human potential as possible. Uh, I believe that uh, I've, I've come to know many people who use cannabis uh, for medicinal purposes or recreational or what have you. And I know that these people are very productive. I'm, I've, I've over the past several years been uh, educated on just how entrepreneurial and hardworking uh, many people who use cannabis are. And so uh, I think you guys have a wonderful opportunity to untap human potential and to help to undo a wrong. Uh, it's, it's well known that El Paso is the first city that criminalized this drug. And so uh, today could be an historic day where the city council makes a move in the right direction to, to undo wrongs. And so I, I do support sign and release. Um, I think the arrest record is harmful. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people who are conservatives who, who don't support, uh, you know, like lessening this war on drugs because they think it's a, a bunch of uh, wrongs caused by, you know, people using it. But the war on drugs has overall been a failure. Uh, the, the use and culture and enthusiasm for this uh, plant has, has spread greatly. And uh, many people are just becoming more and more aware with documentaries and interactions with people at farmers markets of all the benefits and, and let alone the recreational, the people who enjoy it for recreational use, but the people who use it for medicine, um, how dare we uh, go after them with, uh, you know, threat of, um, you know, heavy uh, fines and, and arrest records and stuff like that. Let's take the arrest record off. Let's do site and release or as uh, Judge Morales uh, an hour ago or so said, site and summon. So we're still holding them accountable for, for not following the law, but we are helping people uh, so that it doesn't uh, really have a heavy impact on their future. Um, I think that's said as much as I can think of. So thank you very much, uh, City Council, for your time, but I, I hope you all will uh, support the site and summons um, suggestion. Thank you. I see one more caller in the queue. If you're Mr. Raul Moran or Javier Gutierrez, you may press star six to unmute your telephone and you may begin speaking. Javier Gutierrez or Raul Moran. Mayor, that concludes public comment on this item. All right, we have a number of council members who have requested to speak. Let me bring that up. First of all, I have uh, Representative Rivera, and then Representative Vanello, then Mayor Pro Tem, and then Representative Rodriguez, and then Representative Hernandez. Thank you, Mayor. Is the Chief still on, or did he fall asleep? <laughs> Chief? Or, or District Attorney? Uh, I'm, I'm still asleep. here. Okay. This question is for both of you. Uh, uh, what would be the cost if, if that program is in place right now? What is the what will be what will it be the cost to the taxpayers to start that first chance program? What first chance or sight and release? No, I'm sorry, the sight and release. I apologize, got it mixed well, up. For the for the police department, it's not going to be a cost savings whatsoever, other than the person not being booked. But uh, the workload for the officer, as far as doing the paperwork processing, is still a burden for the officer. So if it's not just a site and then go on about your business, it really has no benefit directly to the officer on the ground because he has to do the same amount of paperwork as if he were putting the person in jail. I'm not against a new tool. If it helps us work more efficiently, that is what we would do. But uh, We've asked Judge Morales to come up with a process that he said wasn't a problem as far as the infrastructure for the county, and we didn't get that response. So our uh, stakeholders were contacted on us because we want to do something that's efficient, but at the same time, if it's not efficient, then there needs to be a, a broader view of what we're looking at as far as to make that efficient. Okay. And it's at the same it's time, it's I remember uh, Judge Morales said that all they would have to do was uh, tweak it here and there so it could get going, get going, uh, as opposed to uh, 
it, it, to establish that that hit the the site and release program. And uh, I guess that's what I was asking you. Maybe uh, District Attorney Ayman Sparsa can answer that. The cost on his end, what would it be? Well, it's not going to cost the county more. What it will cost you, it, it'll cost well, you because you, because, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Because what you're planning on doing, and uh, and I don't agree that it'll, it'll save the officer time. I've always been for putting officers on the street. That's why we have... Since 1995, we've had our DIMS program. I'm for putting officers on the street. But what you're envisioning is creating a ticket that will then be issued to the suspect. And you have to figure out how are you going to notify the courts that you have issued that ticket. Right now, you issue that ticket to the, to the city, to the, to the municipal courts. And you have a process. And you have a very elaborate process. And one of the reasons you have such an elaborate process that works for you is because those tickets are revenue producing. This particular ticket, let's say it's marijuana, is not revenue producing for the for the city. All you're going to do, all all site and release does is avoid the arrest. That the only reason I assume first chance they asked us to talk about that is because first chance avoids the arrest. The advantage of first chance versus site and release is that if you do what you're supposed to do in first chance, which is a pretty simple program, then we never file your case. Under site and release, we will file your case, which means you will have that record. And if you plead guilty, you will have that record of the arrest of your possession of marijuana case. So I'm not seeing, it's not that, uh, I, I wouldn't look to a program that's not, that's, that isn't beneficial for the city all we're doing is avoiding the arrest, period. That's the only thing we're talking about here. And if you do that, there are infrastructure costs that you have to develop because you're going to give that ticket. So, for instance, the way we did site and release, we did it really simple. We knew we knew the case still had to be established, but we gave the we gave the police department a form so they Sir, could are you talking first chance. About you're, you're talking about first chance, right? Right, right. We gave them a form. But if you do site and release, you're going to have to issue a ticket. And if you issue that ticket, you're going to have to you're going to have to do certain things. Like if I get a ticket, how will I know when I'm supposed to go to court? Who's going to notify me? You have to notify us. We're a different system. You are the you are the, the city. We're the <clears throat> county and the state. So you we're not dealing with a class C anymore. We're either dealing with a class A or B where arrest, where going to jail, where your liberty could be taken. It, so this is a wholly different offense. And so it's not, even 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 uh, Representative Moody conceded the fact that you need an infrastructure. You do need an infrastructure. I and mean, that's, that's the, the cost, bottom line. And that's the cost that, 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 that I, I think that's the cost you were referring to earlier. And that's what I'm asking you. What right, cost I don't know what to the, I, to the taxpayers? I don't well, know what that cost is. I don't know your system well enough. All I know is what I expect Right. Which I'm really pleased that the city asked me to talk because that case comes to me. I, I have to I have to file that case. I have to make that case in court. And just so I could clarify something, somebody sure. said earlier, there was we have taken 160 cases <clears throat> since the first year on our first chance program. It's a really great opportunity. And, and, and this isn't about decriminalization or any of that. If, and we're not in a position to change that law. All we're, all you're, I'm charged with is enforcing the law like the, like the police officer is. And so that's all we're doing. And I think first chance is the best and most efficient way to address the issues. Because Judge, because Joe Moody said, well, how about that kid, that kid who's never gotten stopped before, who, who doesn't want to get his uh, scholarship in trouble or his loan application, whatever it is, right. in trouble, first chance takes care of that. And the other thing that's not taken into account here, when you count the number of marijuana cases that, that the city has sent to me, mm -hmm. those cases have also come in a combination of other charges. Yes. And so you would never use, ever, ever use site and release if, for instance, the police officer arrests them for, for shoplifting and, and the marijuana, and the marijuana, or for resisting arrest and the marijuana, or let's say it's a robbery and the marijuana. You're not going to book him on the robbery and cite and release on the marijuana. Makes no sense to do that. Correct. And you already have, 
you should take you take you have taken full advantage of the rest procedures that you already have for instance you don't have an officer standing in line here at the county you have private you have civilian guys you have a private workforce the, the chief knows it better than i do. the chief but we, so we we have used those i mean I'm, I'm 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 all for efficiency i'm all for doing it better I like to think that we've done that for the time I've been here. This this does not move the needle. All right. And you will have to develop a system. It's not. I know that Joe, uh, Joe Moody, he worked here and I know he knows that we take non arrest, but you're doing site and release. So that's a little different. I mean, and th th we're talking in the weeds kind of stuff, the kind of things that we do every day. And so I'm I, I just want you to when if you decide to do it, just do it with just do it with enough information with with your eyes wide open that there will be a cost to doing this and it is not a a revenue producing uh project for you all it's just and that's exact and that's exactly why i was asking because that cost will eventually be incurred by the taxpayer uh, uh and that's why i was wondering if you had a figure an approximate figure what that might be yeah i wish i could tell you that but i was never uh, a city prosecutor and i don't I, all I know is that I, you have a very elaborate system to keep track of your tickets, right? So we know that. I mean, as a citizen, I know that. And I and so that's how you that's how cases get to your muni courts. And that process is not the same as coming to me, you know, coming to county court or district court. So it's, it's a whole different issue. Thank you, sir. And, and again, with the chief, this thing about time. Uh, Putting back the officer on the on the uh, on the uh, in the field, um, it, it, can you tell me if there is any time difference at all? Because I remember the reports, the tagging of the evidence, et cetera, et cetera. If we don't have uh, G4S uh, transport security doing the booking, the officer is going to have to do that himself. That's why I suggested earlier that we enhance the program save officers the time on the ground so that if there's a booking process need to be done they could do it but right now we're looking at 1.3 million dollars that we currently spend on that and to uh increase that in these difficult times financially exactly. would be something that would make it even more problematic for us but with that said you know the uh city as an example has a municipal quarter tracking process for all class c submitted to them that's what Mr. Sparse is talking about as far as an infrastructure. It have to be tracked. And as you well know, yes. not everyone that gets citations plays those citations or follows up on them the way they should. And so we have existing outstanding warrants for people for traffic violations, which are basically a civil def uh, offense right now. And what we're talking about as far as the Class B is a criminal offense. And so when you've got people running around that are basically ignoring criminal charges, that's problematic for us. And you yourself know that a lot of times when a person is using drugs, they're also involved in other crimes. Not always, but that seems to be the rule more than the exception. It's a high percentage, yes, sir. And also, uh, doesn't summons also cost additional costs to the to the city in the form of getting subpoenaed and they don't show up? Ex exactly. We have callback, you know, just like we do on regular court. So an officer would still have to turn around and show up to the court proceeding. But to be fair about that, that's what would take place with the arrest as well. So, but at the same time, the citation right now is just a, a panacea for the moment. It doesn't satisfy anything as far as the long-term consequences of what the costs are going to be. And and again, uh, I'd have to ask both of you: Have you found any? Any cost savings for the first chance program because you 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 resolve it right then there? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's a, it's absolutely it's 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 actually been a very good program. One, I mean, the real benefit is to the suspect. We arrested them for the city attorney. Is this germane to the topic? To the attorney, yes, is this is. germane? To the topic? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, Mayor Potem. Yes, sir. Uh, I just uh, Mayor Potem. Please, Mayor, please don't Mayor, Mayor Potem. Mayor, could you please don't Mayor interrupt? Mayor? Point of order, Mayor. Please, I'm making a point because uh, the first chance program is is uh, is saving the taxpayer money, and I'm asking how much this site and release program will incur. That's germane to the conversation. So, so I'm sorry, sir. Keep you were asking. I, I would just tell you we have we have saved an enormous amount of money because 
What we do with First Chance is just like site and release, we don't book you, but we also don't file the case. So on those cases that are successful, right, and about 70 73% of those who participate in the program are successful, we've never had to file their case. So that means we didn't have to push any of that paper. And life was, and so that is a huge cost savings to us, right? You won't find, like I tell you, this, this site and release is not revenue producing for you or, or for the county. We still, we still have to file those cases. And the cost saving has been huge. And we, we do get a nominal amount of money from the person who enters the program, $100. And we have, we have been able to, uh, on, I think in the last year, we've been able to pay for one individual to help us monitor that program. So it's been a really, it's been a real asset uh, to, our, to what we do and allowing us still to hold somebody accountable for the possession of marijuana and go about their way. And those guys under first chance truly don't have a record because all we did was identify them, period. Okay, okay. thank you to both of you, appreciate that. Uh, um, you know, the, the, the program obviously is being praised the first chance program and, and so i'm just looking out for the taxpayer and you 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 understand what i'm where my position is at as far as that thank you thank you both right. thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Re representative hernandez and then representative anello oh i'm sorry i thought you said okay I for on this. well i we got out of sync i apologize it is representative hernandez thank you mayor um so first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, Speaker Pro Tem Moody. That that is a, that's his official title, Speaker Pro Tem Moody, um, for addressing this council and for your statement. I'm not good. I'm not good uh, at addressing like that. So is that Representative Rivera? Okay. So thank you, Speaker Pro Tem Moody. Um, for for your statements. Um, first, I want to address uh, the the underlining question I had at the beginning of this presentation, um, and, and this is specifically for you, Mrs. Neiman. Um, this was posted incorrectly, and this was posted as a site and release discussion and not a first chance program discussion. So I have some concerns with us um, making sure that we're adhering to the language and the way this was posted. So I get what your intent was, but it was posted incorrectly. And so I just wanna say that we need to make sure that we're adhering to the way that we're posting in accordance with state law. Um, the next thing is that there has been a complete disregard for council's request. The request was to provide recommendations on an implementation of site and release to create that infrastructure that we need that uh, district attorney Esparza has brought up several times we were seeking that infrastructure and that implementation process by working with, with stakeholders. We were not asking for a survey of who was in favor of it. We specifically asked for an implementation process. Six council members voted in favor of that on November 12th of last year. So I wanna have a discussion about why we're talking about a survey, why we're talking about a first chance program that was not even listed on the agenda and we're not, and, and this is a complete disregard to council's directive, Mr. Gonzalez. The directive is clear that the city manager is directed to meet with stakeholders and make recommendation to implement the first, uh, the site and release program, not the first chance program. The second question, the second directive is that the city manager provided quarterly reports to city council on site and release program for the purposes of transparency to provide data concerning the use of discretionary arrests and move citations for nonviolent misdemeanor offenses. This is, I, I have to say I'm very disappointed and I certainly don't want to um, lash out on staff and, and employees, but Mr. Gonzalez, the directive was clear. The recommendation was for implementation and I'm quite frankly disappointed that it was presented in this fashion. So I wanna have a discussion about when it's gonna come back the, the process for implementation as directed by city council, when is, it, when is it gonna come back to council for us to review the implementation process, Mr. Gonzalez? This is Dion. Um, my question, excuse me, Dion, my question was for Mr. Gonzalez, if I can respectfully ask for him to respond, please. Okay, so the, the item as it, was, as it was passed by resolution was for us to meet with all the stakeholders 
and come back and 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 give updates to the city council uh, because of all the things that we've been busy doing over the course of these last several months um, I wanted to make sure the staff came back and gave an update on where they were at the present time we didn't want to ignore those updates to the council even though we've been swamped with other things um, the the fact that the the different people were involved with the, the uh, presentation today pretty much shows that we did look at all the different facets of how to execute a program like this. It does include the DA's office, whether people like that or not. It does include the judges. We included the judge today in the presentation to show both sides of it uh, and, and to, to talk about the different aspects of it. If the council just doesn't doesn't want to talk about the issues, I mean, because we were directed to bring back all the different issues and talk through it and then execute it. If y'all don't want to ex uh, talk about all the different issues that we have to talk about before we execute this, and you just said you y'all direct that y'all just want to execute it, you don't want to have this discussion anymore, then go back and do that. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter was that council, as you pointed out, asked for updates. We did send updates in writing. We, we did give an update today because staff, quite frankly, was not completed with their work because of the things that have occurred. They've been busy with other things, and, and so have I, quite frankly, and so have you. So that's the reason why today wasn't for action because they weren't ready for it to be for action. Okay, well, the, the presentation says otherwise. The presentation says that you are recommending the First Chance Program. And, and I will say that the First Chance Program and the site and release program the way i understand from the judge and from uh speaker pro tem moody is that we can um ensure that those two are done together we're not asking to pick and choose we didn't ask for a survey we were saying let's implement it let's create the infrastructure so we can see this done you know i have i'm having a problem with the trend of the administration mr gonzalez completely disregarding council directives and this is one example of that um, so your response is that this is just an update? Well, then it's my expectation that the directive is fulfilled moving forward. Um, and, and you know, I, had, I have a problem with statements said earlier. Um, the taxpayer um, is our folks, like the veteran who called earlier, like the innocent young teenagers who um, are having a hard time finding housing, having a hard time finding employment because they do not have a clean quote unquote record. When you apply for a job in the city of El Paso or any businesses, they ask you if you have an arrest record. And I can speak on personal experience that that affects your livelihood and your ability to get housing, to get any support from the government, to get financial aid, to get um, employment. So this policy is economic development. This policy aligns clear with our strategic plan. And this policy is going to support El Pasoans and taxpayers. So I completely disagree with the statement said earlier from the, from the representative. And in terms of the time and savings, from what I understand from the chief of police, the alternative is to enhance the transportation vendor. So if we enhance the transportation vendor, we increase those costs. So the alternative is increase the cost with the transportation vendor or use police officers. Either way, it's a cost to the taxpayers. If you don't have an arrest, there's the savings. So it's contingent on a vendor at a cost. Um, and, and, I'm not, and that's the point about this policy is that you don't have a cost for vendors to, to do the transport and you don't have a cost with police officers time. So the alternative is to, to put together a site release program concurrently with the first chance program so that you see those economies of scales that communities need across Texas. This isn't unique to El Paso. This is a state this, law this, uh, to into Representative, and council, Representative and council is asking to count. Yes, sir. If, if I may, um, the the direction wasn't to put the programs together. Um, so if that's right. the direction now. Not even having it. No, no, no. So so what I'm just telling you is that th 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 this was not a, you know, I understand all the passion in, in, in the, 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 the um, the buy-in to the direction of this program. And so that was not disregarded at all. As a matter of fact, like I said already, uh, we did seek out and speak to all sides of this issue and all parts of this issue. Um, bottom line, we did exactly what the council said, is to go out and speak to the stakeholders, make sure that, that when we do implement, 
the, there's no issues with any of it altogether. Um, this has evolved now, it sounds like, uh, in that we don't um, dismiss the site, the, the uh, first chance program, but we do it in concert with it. I mean, this, this whole dialogue was supposed to be exactly that, a dialogue. I mean, I, I can understand, I can appreciate the passion, but, but this is not, a, we, we're, I'm not directing staff, and we, we haven't directed staff to do something different than what council asked for us to do. I mean, if you go back and watch the tape, uh, y'all were very clear about talking to all the stakeholders. I think today demonstrates that we did that. It absolutely demonstrates that we did that. It, it's unfortunate that we're not superheroes right now in, in being able to get this done in addition to all the work that's been put in to the, the focus on our employees regarding all the things that we've wanted to do to not have to do what we have to do later on today uh, with what we uh, with an earlier agenda item. We were busy with that. I, I said when we um, got started with this pandemic, I told council it's not going to be the way it was before where we can knock things out so quickly. And, and, um, and, and we, we, this is a good example of it. So this is not a disregard for anything the council has asked us to do. As a matter of fact, uh, Sir? Again, I reiterate that I think this demonstrates that there has been um, a healthy discussion uh, with the stakeholders and the process of doing this. I do understand the, the two sides of the issue, uh, and more so, uh, there's a lot of people that want this done, and I heard everyone who spoke, so I, I get it. I, I do understand it, and, and what I have asked staff and tasked staff to do, in particular Dion, uh, to, to get all the information and come back with the best uh, information and best recommendation and how to execute, how to implement. So they're not ready. I mean, we could have just not done anything today and been accused of not bringing it back by the by the deadline. Um, but we wanted to at least give an update and again, demonstrate that we have talked to all the parties involved in how we execute this. If, if we would have been just saying, we don't want to do or recommend this and the other, we would not involve the judge. And, and we and obviously, you know, as I pointed out, it, it, whether they included it or not, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't an oversight to include um, the Speaker Pro Tem uh, Moody. Uh, I've had discussions directly with him about this. Um, I, I have not had discussions directly with the DA or with the judge. Um, I left that up to, um, to uh, Greg and his staff and, and to Dion. Uh, so I have not spoken to them directly about it, but I did have discussions with uh, Speaker Pro, Pro Tem Moody about this um, and, and have had discussions with him in the past about this as well. So, so I understand what you're saying, and, and we, I hear it loud and clear. There's no pattern here. When you talk about the administration, there's a pattern. I, I, there's no pattern of, of, of anything other than um, executing the strategic plan. Um, earlier, the discussion that was had on another law enforcement item had to do with directives, and I gave the, the instructions to make sure that that was being followed. So, you know, in terms of um, what we're going through right now with the pandemic, it is it is bringing in a lot of different issues of which this has nothing to do with, I understand. But but the pandemic, I know, has caused a lot of folks to uh, to be on edge. And, and, and you know, the, you know, it's, it's hard not to be in front, uh, you know, us to be face to face and have discussions. But but absolutely not. We, 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 we are not. Uh, going in different directions, uh, absolutely not. Uh, so so this is just a matter of us not being finished with it, uh, but I understand the council's direction and I'm gonna execute it. Sir, may I add that if you go back, and this is Dion Mack, if you go back and review the tape, there were two actions that were considered that day. The first recommendation was to come back with a full implementation, be ready for an implementation of the plan. As you may recall, we did not have the DA or um, the police chief or, or any representative that will be responsible for any of those portions of it at the table as a part of that discussion. The modification to that action was to come back with recommendations. So we're coming forward today to have a broader conversation about what those varying viewpoints are regarding the three entities who would be involved in that process as a result of the conversations that we have. You know, we've been, although we're not in sync in terms of what those messages are, we felt it was very important to have Judge Morales, who would have a portion of this and some costs associated with that, have a voice and be at the table to talk about this, to have the DA and the uh, police chief come and have a broader conversation regarding what these pieces mean. Not saying at all that that recommendation may be what council wants to hear from us, but that was a direction that was given. 
We understood that this would not be the last conversation that we had, but as the city manager said, we made a commitment to coming back. So we're coming back to have that conversation with the information that we have, and you've been able to hear all the things that we have heard in terms of the interviews with, in terms of the logistics, in terms of the cost, in terms of some of those other pieces. And so it was a recommendation for implementing. It wasn't an implementation of the program. And so they're making their recommendation whether you know, it is agreed upon or not. And so that's that's the way that's the reason why it was structured in this way. Right. And um, just closing thoughts, because I know other members of council want to speak. Um, the resolution is clear to me um, that we were seeking an implementation recommendation, um, not a survey of those on how, how they felt uh, it was. We do need the infrastructure. We need the implementation. Um, and, and going back to your statement earlier, Mr. Gonzalez, um, it is important that I convey to you um, how I feel about the way these these things are being messaged and the way it's being presented. And there has been mass confusion that city council members, and I feel the same way, um, were disregarded. And so I need to be able to feel safe to come to you and say those things to you because that's the way I've interpreted that. Mm -hmm. And so it's my expectation that we do fulfill the uh, resolution as requested. And so I'm, I'm not here to chastise. I'm saying that I'm disappointed and that I expect that when we pass a resolution that those uh, directives in the resolution um, come back with definitive answers. And if they're not definitive, then in the presentation at the very minimum, it, we have to say that discussions will continue, that we're going to come forward at a future date. We understand. I think this council is very willing. We understand that there is a, a public health emergency today. Um, and and we're very lenient, but that's not the way it was presented today, and that's why I'm saying I'm disappointed. Well, well, let me well let me speak to that, okay, directly. And this is me talking. I don't have a presentation in front of me. I'll tell you just face to face uh, that that um, I understand what you're saying, and the whole idea. I guess this goes under the heading of no good deed goes unpunished. I mean, the 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 whole idea was to keep the discussion going and to make sure council knew it was top of mind. It was still a priority even though we were going we're going through all these different things and and this particular presentation every nook and cranny we we review all presentations and the fact that this presentation was was not looked at uh at the level that we needed to look at it and but at the same time i i take responsibility for the fact that that we had a healthy discussion got all the input you know as a matter of fact i think it's 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 more um re resounding today than it ever has been in terms of, you know, because if the other council members aren't in agreement with it, they're not talking. So so I'm, I'm assuming that the majority of the council is still in agreement that they want to do this and they're directing us to do this. When we had the discussion before uh, in public, we had, a, we had a discussion very similar to this one. Maybe not to the admonishment piece, but to the whole idea about how, you know, this is a law enforcement issue, and the, but the council was saying, well, we, we want to look at it. And at the end of the day, you're right. The resolution stipulated that you want us to come back and execute this. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would make, I would tell you this, everything I've said to y'all, I've done. Everything. Anything I say we're going to do, I carry, I carry, carry it out. I think you can say, you can agree to that. That if I say we're going to do something based on the direction we've been given, we execute it. So we are going to execute this. When we bring this back, we'll bring it back completely finished. We won't have any discussion anymore. It'll be a recommend, make recommendation based on the direction council has given. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Assistant Chief Sarud, I'd like to chime in on the last part, please. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so we weren't ignoring that directive. We felt that we were working within the directive. Um, we met with the stakeholders in regards to this, as noted on the presentation, and we also asked for the process. We asked for the process a second time. It was never presented to us. We, the police department, knowing that the district attorney handles all misdemeanor cases in regards to possession of marijuana for adult offenders, we looked at that as well. And as a police department, we looked at what's in place at this time, and that's been around for the two years. And we felt that this program offers the first chance the first time offenders an opportunity for to have a clean record so i just want to stress the fact that we felt we were within the directive again we met with everyone and to this day we have not received any process it's been discussed at a meeting by phone and at today's meeting but we haven't had anything presented before us so when we sat down and looked at the options and knowing that 
we look at the process with the first chance program and we know what we have in place and I also want to chime in that the fact is G4S whether they transfer one individual or 10 individuals the cost is the same there's no cost saving on that section so I wanted to let you all know in regards to that portion yeah this chief Allen along with that uh, you know, we cannot force what we want to do on the county right now when they're going to be the handlers of the cases that we present to them on this first chance. If that is absent, it doesn't matter that we write a citation. It goes nowhere. And then it has no substance to it whatsoever. And then going back to the early comment about uh, people having criminal records, again, to reemphasize, the first chance does not give you a criminal record, whereas if you do get a cite and release citation, you will have a criminal charge. You will have a criminal charge. So the, the problem doesn't go away simply because you got the citation. All right, our next speaker is uh, Representative Anello. Mayor, thank you, Mayor. Can I can I address the issue that Representative Hernandez asked about in terms of the posting language? I've gone back and looked at the meeting the meeting item that was presented back in November, November twelfth of twenty nineteen, and Council directed staff to postpone the item and bring bring it back on April twenty seventh. As the, everybody historically knows, when items are reposted, they're used as the same item that was posted back in April in November. The item posted in November read exactly the way it says, except that staff added update by Chief Allen and District Attorney regarding site and release resolution on a class A and B possession of marijuana offense. That was the way the item was brought back and reposted because it was postponed. Um, I think that what part of the frustration is um, and this, you know, is kind of the trouble with how it was passed at council, um, because council did pass that resolution. And Ms. Neiman is correct. Then we asked for a recommendation. And I, and I think for me, what has been frustrating are some of the comments that have been made. Um, and most of them were made by the district attorney and not trying to single him out, but I just want to be clear. Things like what happens if you get the ticket um, and you will need a process because that's what we thought this conversation was going to be, right? We thought that there was going to be stakeholder meetings and we were gonna come back with some suggestions on how to implement the resolution that we passed. Um, that's not what has happened today. And so Mr. Gonzalez, I know that you've spoken about it and you said you're coming back, but I would like us to come back with some actual policy and implementation measures. I also want to talk a little bit about the stakeholder meetings because in my mind that meant that everybody would be at the table um, whether they agreed or disagreed um, I think everyone we've heard from today has really good input on this the DA the sheriff the chief of police but also uh, the reason we asked Mayor Pro Tem um, Moody to be part of the conversation is because or I'm sorry not Mayor Pro Tem Speaker Pro Tem because he is the Speaker Pro Tem and this is an ability that we have passed down by the state legislature. I don't know if um, Speaker Pro Tem is still on the call and he wants to tell us how those meetings went, if there anyone asked him about what the best way to implement this policy was. Is he still on the I call? I met with him and he promised to send me some information. This is Dion Mack, I never received it. I just okay, posted I, the motion. Uh, I spoke to him and had a very different conversation with him where he did not feel like his input was wanted or needed. Um, so if you had another conversation with him, if you could please yeah, follow I, I, up with him I, and ask him to send that. I just, um, I did send it to council before. I just wanted to let you all know that I posted the motion to the chat so you can see what that would do for us. Okay. Um, I have the motion in front of me. Thank you. Um, also, there's been a lot of conversation about this issue during COVID-19 um, and what the sheriff does and what the county does. I have been in numerous budget conversations for the Council of Governments with all law enforcement in this area and the sheriff has made it very apparent he's just been very direct about the fact that the jail is an issue right now keeping people safe in the jail is an issue right now and he has specifically said at a meeting that i attended that the city is continually arresting for low-level misdemeanor cases and it is putting him in jeopardy so i mean this i think is the perfect time to be having this conversation and we really need to be talking talking about how we're moving forward 
again, Mr. Gonzalez, I would like to see the next conversation we have about this. You know, I hope it does not get to a year since this resolution was passed an actual implementation process. Can I chime in and offer something? This is Judge yes, Morales. Yes, Judge, go ahead. So one thing I wanted to tell you, I, I, it was mentioned that during the pandemic, it's hard to deal with this. Honestly, instituting site and release during the pandemic, I think would be extremely helpful. Um, as you were indicating that it would help the sheriff uh, keep people from having to be booked in the jail. So I think it would actually be helpful to institute that at this point in time, even though it might be difficult with everything else that's going on. But a lot of the things we're doing right now are difficult with everything that's going on. Doesn't mean it can be done, can't be done. And I'm here to tell you that it can be done. Also with respect to uh, the cost of, of, of instituting site and release, site and release is going to save taxpayer money. How much it saves and where it saves it, I can't give you those numbers because I'm not part of all the budget processes, whether it be for the city or for the county, but it just stands to reason and it makes sense. And uh, uh, District Attorney Jaime Esparza told you the first chance program is saving money because people aren't being arrested and processed and whatnot. You're going to see similar savings from the site and release program. How much it's going to save and who it's going to save again, I can't tell you who, uh, how that's going to work with respect to implementing the process. It's just a matter of getting everybody to agree that the process is going to be implemented and getting us all to meet together and discuss it. And a process can be implemented and it can be implemented quickly. As far as the courts go, uh, you know, I, I think I, I met with uh, uh, Chief uh, Ellen and Assistant Chief Zerur, and we were discussing whether or not, you know, their thoughts on it whether it could work or not. Um, but until they decide that they're going to go ahead and, and go forth, go forward with what the, the city council has told them that it wants them to do, um, it's not really for the courts to be starting the process. With that said, if anybody says, okay, courts, regardless of whether you have buy-in from the DA's office, regardless of whether you have buy-in from the police department, we want you to come up with the process as you think it would work. We, the courts, will do that. We'll provide you a process that we think will work. And then once we provide that process, uh, if the DA's office, the city manager, the police department, whoever else wants to discuss it with us, we can discuss it and we can uh, make sure that it's set up in such a way that it's, that it's going to work. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Uh, Mayor? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to... Um address uh, all the comments that have been made by the council uh, up to this point at, at the at the last count when this item was directed i'm going to go back and i'm going to personally look at the directive and the discussion because i think what we did today is in the spirit of what we were asked to do um the, the y'all asked throughout that process about the, the recommendations or or information and the data to be shared with the council of what the police went and found and come back and share it with the council. I'm gonna go back and look at that, but what I hear today very clearly that the council is saying they want this. So again, uh, I've heard that loud and clear. The rest of the council has not said anything. So I'm gonna take that as unanimity. And so I'm taking the direction to be, regardless of the data, come back and recommend this and show how it's gonna be executed. Same if, there are, if there are ebbs and flows in the issue, we need to work through it and work around it. That's what I'm hearing, and we'll, we'll do that. We'll work through the ebbs and flows, um, the bumps. I mean, the judge has made a good point about anytime you put a program in place, it's not going to be perfect. And so there's going to be different things that you have to adjust for. And I agree with them that, that there, if, if, if this program or any other program, um, you, you know, that's being done, and especially that's being um you know, asked of, of, of them to do whenever there's a lot of other issues. And I understand the judge's point about, you know, well, you know, this is the perfect time to do it. I get it. And, but but, but the, there's a lot of things that we're doing relative, even aside the pandemic, there's just a lot of issues on the table relative to our entire operations. But, but I understand loud and clear today what the council is saying. But from previous directives, again, I think what we did today in the spirit of that relative to the discussion relative to the input relative to the fact 
that we did speak to all the stakeholders as council directed. That was very clear for us to speak to all the stakeholders in the process. All right, let me. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm reading my time because I'm, I had asked. I'm not I'm not taking account. away from your time, but let me address the city manager, please, as chairman of this board. Okay, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, just because you haven't heard from everyone doesn't mean that everyone is in agreement. I want to make that abundantly clear. We've had no votes on this, so consequently, the uh, what you have is the discussion that's. Uh, we bring a new new meaning to the word belabor, but uh, in irre irrespective of that, we have had no votes, and so until we have a vote, do not assume just because we have a majority of, uh, of uh, voices that are being heard today that are, are going this, that we have this. So, Representative Manello, go ahead. Well, Mayor, I would just like to remind you that the resolution passed by the council with a majority. The supermajority, actually, I believe. Um, and so I had asked uh, Representative or Speaker Pro Tem Moody, um, there had been a conversation about getting some input um, back to the city. And my question had just been, you know, I was concerned that I didn't feel like these were stakeholder meetings, that you were all called in individually. Um, and, and if you had input for us that you would like to share. Can, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Sir. Okay, sorry. Um, look, I've, I've certainly participated in a number of stakeholder meetings and conversations around criminal justice issues around the entire state uh, with people that have extremely different viewpoints than I have, and some people that uh, some people that agree with me. Um, I, I will say the meeting that I had in this process didn't resemble that at all. Um, and that's fine. I mean, what I told the folks from the PD is if it, look, they, they don't, they do not think this is something they want to do. I, I don't begrudge them their opinion. I have a very different one. And I think the policy is one that we should push forward on. There are policy makers, uh, at the city that I think feel the same way. And, you know, I try to be as respectful as possible. I don't think that was returned, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it, these aren't, these aren't, these aren't impossible issues, right? I mean, the main point I brought up at the meeting was they want to know what does this look like in other communities? Well, the fact of the matter is other communities have gone way past this, light years past this. Uh, people won't do site and release in Austin because they have a broad-based, uh, they have a broad-based um, uh, cannabis program there that they're not bringing people into jail on this at all. It's not offender based, it's offense based. Harris County has the same thing. Dallas has the same thing. Noises County has the same thing. So when you're looking for things to mimic incite and release, people have gone so far past that in progressive uh, uh, law enforcement protocols and prosecution protocols that we don't have a lot of examples. Now, San Marcos was, is probably the first city to implement a site and release policy that, that, that houses all seven of the offenses that are authorized under the Code of Criminal Procedure. Um, and so that would be worth looking at but when i sit in a meeting and i'm told um uh when i'm told you know you have a major stakeholder that doesn't want to be part of a conversation about this and it's if there is no further to discuss it it's not really the most you know it's not a meaningful conversation it's not a productive conversation i look you can have that opinion uh it, it didn't resemble or look like any kind of stakeholder meeting i've had in the past i'm happy to continue to engage i understand that people are going to come down on different sides of this. Um, but honestly, uh, you know, this, this, this is a pretty straightforward uh, uh, addition to the First Step program. So First Step program, offender-based, no criminal record for someone that hasn't interacted with, with law enforcement before. Uh, that's, that's a good policy. It's not as broad as it should be, but it's a good policy. Uh, and it's certainly creating cost savings. The next step up would be let's not arrest someone for this low-level offense even if they have some criminal history and they're only in possession, right? If, the other, if, the other, if there's other criminality going on, they're going to be arrested. That's just the way it goes. So we're not really talking about, you know, you're not talking about you know, a dangerous situation because if someone poses a threat to public safety, uh, for whatever reason, the officer then has, has additional discretion to put that, to, to arrest that person. So you can weave this in, this becomes offense based, not offender based. And, and I do, 
you know, I do take issue when we say that this doesn't move the needle for anything. I'll tell you who it moves the needle for. The person that's not being thrown in jail it moves the needle for them. Okay, they made, they made a mistake, and they have to answer for the consequences. Take the incarceration part out. It's unnecessary. It's dehumanizing. And we have to change the way we think about these policies. So that's who it benefits. And there'll be a marginal tax. There'll be some sort of tax benefit. There's no way around that. Um, you know, it, it's the extent of it, and Judge Morales said, the extent of it we don't know. But there's a philosophical policy question that we have to answer. Do we think we need to throw people in jail for low-grade possession of marijuana? I say no. <laughs> I, I don't see the value of it. What are, we, what are we accomplishing? Everybody's saying, well, we're not saving money. What are we accomplishing by throwing someone in jail? And if they can't bond out and they lose their job, what have we done to them? You know, yes, they made a mistake. Hold them accountable. Have consequence for them. And they will have a criminal record under the site and release policy. I get that. But that arrest part, that incarceration part, is a destabilizing factor in the criminal justice system. I, I'm, I'm, I don't have to be the one to tell you. You can read mountains and mountains and mountains of, of, of research that's been done on it. This is a step in the right direction. The first chance program does not have to come in to the conversation because it can exist at the same time. They are not mutually exclusive. They are addressing two separate issues. Um, happy to continue in this conversation. I do want to say that um, you know, the city manager and I have had multiple conversations about, uh, about this. Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, it, you know, I, I think that when they go ask stakeholders and are essentially told no, that creates a very problematic part of their job in reporting back to council. And so I, I am very grateful for his leadership uh, in the savings he's made today because we need to figure out what this looks like and then let the policymakers decide because that's how this works. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Schwarzbein. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, um, I just want to first thank um, everybody for this really quick. I just need to do this. I wanted to thank uh, photographer Ruben Ramirez for allowing me to use his image um, from Saturday's protest that I used um, during agenda item number three. So thank you, Ruben, for that. And I just wanted to give him credit for using his photograph. Um, you know, I think there's two separate things here. I think that first there is the um, item that was presented here um, about uh, site and release. Um, but also there, there, there is this issue about um, really uh, a frustration about um, policy not being implemented, direction not being followed um, by votes by this council. And there's been a number of times where we've seen that. Uh, we saw it this past weekend. Um, we've seen it with other items before. And there in no way is, is this, this presentation, this update, at all reflective of what was voted by a six to two supermajority by the city council. There is no way. There is more information given by people in public comment about, about figures of costs, about figures of arrests than were done by our own city staff for this presentation. And the fact that the first response was the first chance program was on here when our own city attorney was not aware of it, um, it just it really points to a larger issue because the count the the agenda item here specifically states city managers directed to meet with stakeholders and make recommendations to implement a site and release program and the conclusion of this the conclusion of this is that the district attorney's office the el paso police department sheriff richard wiles favored the first chance program that's the conclusion that's the research that is the recommendations to implement a site and release program i you know again it's it's frustrating because you know we are what we are seeing is is city council directives not being followed um it doesn't address what city council's issues were and i really appreciate judge morales for being on here um because he was actually answering what we asked city staff to research. He was actually giving us the information um, there about it. I mean, do we know how much this will cost? We don't because staff didn't do the research. Staff didn't do the research, you know? And 
it's it's a question of accountability and this is something that i brought up before you know but it's it's something of accountability because you know who sets policy for the city of el paso does the police chief create policy for the city of el paso i thought it was city council that that did it um i have a question for the chief if if he's still there Chief, are you there? See, I'm here. All right. If will you execute and implement a site release program if it's passed by the city council? That's the directive. Yes. But again, going back to uh, what's being discussed here, we can't impose what our values are. What this program on another uh, government entity? It's the county. If they're not in line with that they haven't bought into that they're not willing to put up the money for that it seems like we're spending our wheels for an effort that's not really going anywhere because we're trying to make a commitment to another government entity to do something that they may not be willing to do judge morales was supposed to get back to us on his recommendations for that and we didn't get it that's why we presented what we basically had and so the consequence of what we saw today was that the information that we requested from the judge to implement this program was not given to us. So we worked with what we had. The first chance program is what we saw working and efficient. And Mr. Esparza pointed out facts of that. And some of the comments as far as numbers and statistics that were presented by other people were incorrect. I sent you all back a few months ago information from the DEA on the problems or what's taking place in Washington and Colorado as far as drug use up there. Those are more accurate. And uh, uh, these comments uh, uh, that we, we dropped the ball, I, I'll take some blame for that, but I can't see where I have the authority or the city government itself can impose requirements on the county government that they're not willing to buy into. But this 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 item was was not about that. It was finding out the implementation and the costs. The implementation requires us to write a citation, and like Mr. Sparsa was trying to say, it has to go someplace. It has to go someplace for it to have substance, and that substance is missing because now it's just a piece of paper floating in the wind. If we don't have a follow-up process in place, and that's what's missing in this, and I can't impose what I want to do on the county. We already have a case. We already have similar situations. I already talked about this. Maybe Judge Morales, you want to talk more about it or even Speaker Pro Tem Moody about non-arrest cases and the infrastructure for them. I don't know if you so want to talk again, about that, Judge Morales. Again, it's still a process that is a little bit different because it goes through a detective process and then it's presented to the DA's office on non-arrest. We do that all the time right now. We work as efficiently as we possibly can, but I want to say something and not arresting people that commit crimes of a trivial nature. I want you to pay attention or realize that that does have an effect on the crime rate of El Paso. It's not just something that goes away simply because it's supposedly a small offense. People who offend in small ways drive crime. A beer run, as an example, drives our crime, even though it's a larceny of $50 or so, it still impacts our crime rate to the point where it counts significantly, significantly, just like a felony would. And if a person pushes someone, it turns into something higher, like a robbery, simply because force was used in that particular event. So minor crime, to trivialize that and say it's not impactful, is a falsehood. Well, I mean, we didn't cite we didn't cite people for violating a public health emergency order. And There's a big difference between citing a crowd and inciting an individual. I cite a crowd and I incite a riot, and then we have people injured, officers injured, lawsuits coming, and on it goes simply because we wanted to show who was in charge. That's not no, what it's, it's all I'm, about. It's a it's about a, a public health emergency and people not in, endangering themselves and others. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot more work needs to be done. I think a lot of points were already raised by, by the other fellow council members here. Um, there obviously needs to be a lot more research done about the cost of arrests. Um, you know, 
I really appreciate um, the work and the service that that District Attorney Esperanza has given our community. Um, but we also need to also face the fact too that in the next couple of months there will be a new district attorney, and um, their direction and their understanding about this um, is one that we really need to pay attention to moving forward. Um, you know, it's 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 not a question of us not being able to do this. This is something that we can do. This is something that that dozens of other communities in Texas have done, whether they're smaller than us or larger than us. Um, and there's reasons why they're doing that. And so um, I really think that we need to to do that. And again, city manager, I, I, you know, again, this is this is not the first time where we've seen a council directive, a council vote not be followed. And that's concerning. When, when, else, was, when else has that happened? Peter, when else is really, that really? Yeah. How about how about when we had a six to two vote to go and postpone to, to ask for a postponement of the settlement of the electric company and nobody was sent from city staff? I mean, you want to bring it up? We're in hour number almost hour number 10 of this council meeting. I There's think we've had a little uh, too much flagellation here. Let's back off and be a little more civil here. That's all right. That's okay. all right. Let's be a That's little right. more civil. I wasn't I'm asking. I'm so, Mayor Pro Tem, the, the issue that Greg is trying to explain to you is not just something that, that, that it's not something that's flippant. Those other cities that you referenced, those other communities, they, they had everyone participating. And so, um, I've just been talking to Representative to the Speaker Pro Tem Moody, and, you know, if we have to wait longer, uh, in order to make sure we have agreement from the county, we will do so. But y'all just need to understand it might take that in order for this to be a smooth transition. You know, yes. for you to say that, you know, other communities have done it, we can do it too. I mean, we've done things that other communities haven't done. So, so with respect to how this gets carried out, you know, I, I've heard y'all loud and clear. I've already said to uh, Representative Hernandez, and I'm telling you, that we're, we, we, heard, we hear you loud and clear. Mayor, I heard the mayor what he said, but um, you know, in terms of, I looked at the resolution and what it stated. Um, and so I think as, as I've, already, I've already stated that what we did today was we did talk to the stakeholders and we did communicate that to y'all. So you mentioned something um, with regard to the electric utility. Got it, heard you. But I don't think you can say something across the board like that, some general statement like that when it's not, it's simply not true. We we carry out the directives that council gives us. We 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 take pride in that, and we take pride in what we do. So for you to say that flippantly, it, I don't think it's it's not accurate and it's not fair. Well, I, I, with with all oh, due respect, I, I don't think I'm the, I, I don't think I'm the only council. With all due respect, I don't think I'm the only council member that feels that way. Well, can I speak to that issue because I don't understand why we're bringing up that subject. Four months afterwards, but I traveled was, back to Austin every single time after we had that hearing. I addressed that with council, and honestly, I was dragged out on the carpet every single public meeting at the time that we were doing the the electric company merger. And I was called on on it. I apologized for it. I paid for it. I traveled every single time. The fact that you're upset about this presentation today has absolutely no bearing on what happened back in November of 20, 2019. That's, that that's unfair, and that I made correct. up for it. Let's move again, on. And again, I'm, no, with all due respect, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to wrap it up and come where I'm coming from, is that there is a feeling from this council, and it's more than just me, that oftentimes the respect and the understanding of us as policymakers creating direction is not respected or followed through by staff. And that we are we are blown away and put to the side. Well, then I'd and, like to have a conversation with you about that, and with the other council members that feel that way, because we execute the the, the what the council's wishes are, the majority of the council's wishes. We absolutely that, do. We yes, I, we no. have never not executed something that the majority of the council has asked us to do. Never since I've been here. Representative Horsbein, you speak for District One only. Period. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, Mayor. Unless you want to have a couple others come in and join you, that's it. 
No, I'm not, I'm not really dark and trying to I would never tend to continue this. I just hope that this mayor, I just hope that this council director I just hope I think I think whenever whenever the work that I do and my staff does is impugned, I'm gonna say something. And I will tell you that everything the council has asked me to do, has asked the staff to do, we have executed everything that the majority of the council has asked us to do. And we will continue to do that as long as I'm here. So, like I said before, um, I'm, you know, I, I said what I said. There's, there's clear that this, that this presentation did not go and research what was there. It didn't. Well, with all due respect, and, I and, thought it was and very that's not me impugning. That's yeah. not me impugning or anything like that. You know, I, you know, it's a long day here. I understand that people that people are there, but the council directive wasn't followed. You know, we had we had what we had on Saturday. Ms. Nick, reiterate what the council directive was for clarification purposes to both uh, Rep Representative Horsebine and Representative Manello. So I've, and, I've and the other thing too is to listen to the meeting, the recording of November twelfth of twenty nineteen, and the discussion. And the item that was passed was that the city manager be directed to meet with stakeholders and come back with a recommendation to implement the site and release program. We didn't vote for a site and release program. We voted actually, for the information. Actually, that's not true. No, the, the, ex the, ex ex Senate, ex the resolution was amended to add that, but the whole resolution with that amendment was passed. I'm, lo like, I'm looking I'm at what right now. I'm, uh, I'm looking at what was passed I'm looking at what was passed by this presentation. That is what I that is what I read for verbatim, that the city manager is directed to meet with the stakeholders to make recommendations, implement a site and release program. That was the action that's on this council backup that was seen by multiple people from our city staff. You tell me that isn't the correct action because I don't see the recommendations to implement a site and release program. And to be honest, you know I don't I don't think Speaker Pro Tem Moody really wants to get into what that meeting was like that he had. That stakeholder meeting. All right. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Schwarzbein, and, and that's the reason why the item was posted as an update. The the request, the directive that the council made, when y'all you, you're assuming a lot, you're you're insinuating a lot, because all this was was an update. This was an update. That's why it was posted that way. And what the discussion showed is that we did have dialogue. We did have discussion. Now, I'm gonna personally talk to uh, Speaker Pro Tem Moody. I've been talking to him while, while we're all talking right now. I'm gonna personally finish that conversation and, and have a dialogue with him and a sit down on this entire program. I'm personally gonna do that with him. It just, again, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of support in wanting to explore that. That was clearly communicated in this presentation that's been communicated privately and publicly before. And it's not a question of staff's feelings about whether or not they want to do a site and release program. That is a council direction. That is policy. And if we want to talk about getting into the weeds and all this stuff, like, you know, this is something that this council wanted to explore. Six to two vote. That's not a four four split, you know, with with old with old Mayor Margo coming in there to, to split it up. That's a clear directive. So, anyways, thank you. All right, Representative Lazarga. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to thank everyone who um, called in with public comment, and I want to thank our city manager, our city attorney, our police chief. I was one of the two uh, representatives that voted against uh, the site and release. I wanted more information from our district attorney, Mr. Esparza, and also I wanted to hear back from our police chief, Ellen. And so I really appreciate hearing their input today about the various programs that are out there that are available. Um, I just, I, 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 I speak for myself, obviously, as a District 8 city representative, and I, I want to commend our city manager, our city attorney, for all their hard work during this pandemic. I know a lot of people are very um, feeling very frustrated, 
but I think our our biggest commodity at the city of El Paso is our human capital. And I I take issue sometimes with the other representatives who want to call out people um, in a public manner like like that's been presented this afternoon. And um, so I just want to commend you all for all your hard work. I do have a question, uh, Chief Allen, you know, you were talking about the site and release, and um, we were talking about the process, right? And That's fair. it's, it's going to be coming from the county, and so the county's not on board, correct? With the, I yeah. mean, who who exactly from the county um, has to be involved in this process? It's going to have to be the the, the county ahead. attorney or the district attorney. And I take it right now it's the district attorney, along with one court that's going to have to handle the caseload that potentially might be presented to them. So the process of writing a citation from the city has no bearing whatsoever on it being followed up as suggested by uh, Judge Morales if there is no infrastructure in place to handle that and process it and then bring that person to justice eventually for that violation at that time. And right now, the citation uh, workload for the officer writing it is just as great as it would be if they were incarcerating that person. Okay, can, so can the county, oh, go Wait. ahead, I'm sorry. sorry. Yes, yes. So, thank the, the you, Judge courts. Morales. Also, for all of your input, I really appreciate it. So the county courts that handle criminal cases, there's eight county courts that handle criminal cases. I'm the local presiding judge for those county courts, so I'm here to speak on behalf of those county courts. So we're the ones that would be handling the misdemeanor cases, and we are the ones that would be setting up the hearings for those courts. And in conjunction with county court administration, which would uh, be dealing with uh, settings and things like that. And then of course the DA's office is a county entity also, so they'd be involved in, in uh, handling that. As far as the costs go, I believe that the costs are going to go down. I don't know how much they're gonna go down, but this is going to be a cost savings across the board for the city and for the county. Again, I don't know what those exact numbers are, but it just stands to reason that if you're going to cite people and give them a summons instead of arresting them, that the cost is going to be much lower. Again, how much lower, I don't know. So those are the things I can tell you as far as the county courts and county court administration, we are ready and willing once the city and you know any of the entities, if any entity comes and tells us we want to implement this program. Will you work with us? We will absolutely work with them. Now, if the city wants the county courts to come up with a process without input from the PDs, uh, the, uh, uh, the police department and the DA's office, we can do that also. Although I would suggest to you that it would be uh, more beneficial if we all got together. And when I say all, you know, the police department, the DA's office, uh, the county courts, the city manager, uh, whoever else may be involved, and came up with a plan that everybody thinks is going to work. But again, if they don't want to do that, and so my initial, uh, I, I know Chief Allen and uh, Assistant Chief Zeror mentioned that uh, they had asked for a plan and we hadn't come up with one. Well, again, as I said at the very outset of this, there's it, it doesn't seem to, uh, it doesn't seem to be a reason to come up with a plan when you are told by the chief of police that they are not in support of this program and they really don't intend to institute this program. Now I'm hearing something different. I'm hearing that the city through its representatives is wanting to implement this or directing the police department to implement. And I even heard Chief Allen say that if he is directed to implement it, he will get it done, which I know he will. Uh, so with that in mind, we can get that done and we can get it done quickly. And as I also said later on, it would be very beneficial to everybody involved if this program could be uh, implemented during our current pandemic because it would decrease the number of people going through our jail. Whether that can be done or not, I don't know, but I believe that it can be done and we are willing to try to get it done. So, Rep Representative Lissara, if I could just add, I, in a lot of ways, I don't disagree with what Judge Morales is saying, but what he doesn't tell you is if you issue a ticket 
and then you release the individual, there has to be a process to get the case to county court. Now, that's the, that's the discussion that is not being had. What is, what is the infrastructure to get the case there? Right. And what he what he also fails to tell you is it is true. The judges are have a great role in this, but I file the cases. So that information has to get to me so that I can. I have looked at the program in Nueces County. Nobody's talked about that. Somebody has to get that case to the prosecutor so the prosecutor can file it with the district, with the county clerk. So that so we can be ready to hear that case. That discussion isn't occurring. And that's not if you ask me, well, well, how much will that cost? I don't know your processes and I don't know how you're going to have the officer write the ticket. Right. And so that you so that I will know that that case is coming to me. That's the difference. And it's not like a non arrest case. And I know that those who are listening probably don't understand the distinction. But if you're writing the ticket and you expect that individual to be notified where to go, in two weeks, a month, wherever that is, then there has to be a process to get the case to us. If, if it, it's not that I'm not in favor of it, I, I, I just looking at the efficiencies. I agree that, that uh, Speaker Pro Tem Moody has he he says it's it's offense based. I, it's not that I don't agree with that approach. My, my look is what is the most efficient and cost effective way to do the business that we're doing. And so we offer the first chance program right now. We, we haven't discussed this at length, but we offer it not just to those people who are first offenders. We let we give it to you if you've been arrested numerous times. You know, Judge Morales knows that, but he hadn't told you that there. There's a wide parameter of who gets that. And we are now pooling cases from the county courts so that we can move our possession of marijuana cases so that we can get them into the first chance program. So there's a discussion here that we haven't had. But the, but for me, the infrastructure question is the most, is the greatest one. How are you going to notify me, the city of El Paso, notify the state of Texas, that's me, that you have filed your case, that this case occurred? How are you going to do that? And if, you, if you're, you, the non-arrest approach isn't the appropriate approach. And I'm, I'm sure it looks like, uh, and if we've been here way too long, I'll shut up. But that is the issue for me. And I'm sure Judge Malas has a response, but I file the cases. The judge does not. The judge hears the case that I file. He doesn't hear the case he wants to have filed. He only hears the cases that the state of Texas filed. And then we have, then we decide, right? So there's, there, there are greater issues than that. So it's not, it's past really. And, and, and I, I, I have a great deal of respect for, for Representative Moody. I have a great deal, and, and he, he does talk, he, he, he works in this area a lot, but I have some fundamental problems with how you institute that, especially knowing that the process we're using is currently working and, and, and there's no additional cost at the moment. And that's, that's my issue, but I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Can, can I just say real quickly, real quickly, so if we talk and we communicate between Mr. Esparza and the county courts and county court administration, we can figure it out. It's as simple as that, but there needs to be communication and there needs to be a discussion. And there has not been that communication and there has not been that discussion with the uh, goal of implementing. The discussion has been, what do you think? What do, you know, just getting opinions without a discussion as to how it will be implemented. That was the discussion that occurred with the, the chief and the assistant chief was what they thought about it and you know what we had available, but it really wasn't to the extent of, okay, we're gonna do this, tell us how we do it. It was just in theory, if this were to be done, how would it be done? But now, again, hearing what everybody said, if everybody works towards getting it done, it can be done and it will be done and it'll, it'll work. Uh, so that's all I'll say on that. Uh, Speaker Pro Tem Moody would like to say something. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I do want to clarify when I spoke about non-arrest cases previously. I said there is a process to get non-arrest cases. Not that this was congruous to that situation, but we have previously thought through how to do this. 
you now have a huge, you, you digitize the interaction between PD and the DA's office. That's a, a remarkable task that took years to do. So saying that the, that the there's no possibility that there's, this is an unanswerable question is, is a little bit confounding. But at any, at any rate, um, my main point is um, th there is always the ability to work through a, through a problem if there's consensus on where we want to go. Um, I am happy to be a part of those conversations if it's productive. Um, you know, Mr. Gonzalez has reached out to me even during the course of this, this meeting to follow up on this uh, based on our other conversations. I, I'm committed to working with him or whoever, uh, you know, whatever side of this issue they come from, because I do believe that is the right policy to implement. Um, I, I have worked in the minority my entire legislative career every single year of it, and have been able to get broad measures across the finish line in a very diverse state i refuse to believe that this environment in the city of el paso working with a handful of partners we can't implement a policy like this i refuse to believe that we don't have the ability to work together to complete this task i am stand ready to help in any way shape or form uh, if, if, if the way I can help is by getting out of the way and letting smarter people figure it out, then, then Mr. Gonzalez, tell me that too. I want to hear that too, because you have to know when you have to get out of the way as well. Um, I, I am, I am here to help in any way, shape or form. I'll stand ready. Uh, I've got to go wrangle some children here. Uh, so I'll have to drop off, but I, I call on me for whatever you need on this or any other issue. Thank you. Uh, speaker pro tem sissy. Did you want to say something else? No, no, thank you, Mayor. Thank you very okay. much for everybody's right. input. Thanks, everybody's input and all the emotion. It was exciting.